The Last of the Vikings by Johann Boyer, translated by Jesse Muir. One. The dim blue twilight had already followed. Linda Gord rang to call the workers home to supper. Its sound rose and fell like an angelus over fjord and mountain. The farm laborers out on the wide golden cornfield stood erect and, taking their dinner tin in one hand and their sickle in the other, set out in companies for their homes, with the red light from the glowing clouds lying above the snow mountains in the west reflected in their faces. Lindegord stood upon a hill, like an old castle. The windows in the great white house were aflame with the rays of the setting sun. The garden and grounds extended almost to the water, and in the background lay the numerous red-painted farm buildings, constituting almost a little town by themselves. It was as though this large farm had pushed the others away, toward the outskirts of the district, either eastward toward the wooded slopes where the small farms clung to the hillside, or northward to the bare mountains facing the sea. And when the bell at Lindegord rang, the bells from the other farms all over the countryside chimed in. The farm laborers lived in the little fishermen's cottages down by the steel-gray fjord, each with a small piece of land about it. They were pledged to work many weeks of the year on the big farm, and cultivated their own land when they came home in the evening, and even then they had to resort to the sea for their principal means of subsistence. They took part in the herring fisheries in the autumn, and in the winter sailed hundreds of miles in open boats up to Lufulton, perhaps tempted by the hope of gain, but perhaps, too, because on the sea they were free men. This evening a single worker still remained on one of the large barley fields, looking from Lindegord only like a black speck in all the yellow. But it was a woman, Maria Miran, the wife of one of the farm laborers. Cutting the corn on the big farm was a duty, and though Maria had done twice an ordinary day's work, she wanted to finish the last little bit before she went home, but she dreaded having to stand erect, for she was ready to drop with fatigue. The sickle glittered as she cut, and with red swollen hands she drew the damp corn toward a skirt that was long since wet through. There was grace in every movement of the slender figure in the grey dress. The black kerchief on her head kept slipping back, and every time she pulled it forward again with the hand that held the sickle. She had scarcely eaten anything since morning, and now it was not only her back that ached, but her breasts, too, were heavy. On a heap of straw near her lay what looked like a bundle of clothes, but every now and then it moved and talked. Now it had begun to make little whimpering sounds, too, and the reaper said to herself, He's hungry, but he'll have to wait. The little one had kicked off the clothes his mother had spread over him, and now he stretched a fat little leg into the air and tried to get hold of his toes. There may be a good deal to say about such a proceeding, so he talked all the time, saying, Do, 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 and ta, 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 but he was nevertheless very near crying. In the meantime both legs had become uncovered and began to feel cold, so why should he not set up a scream that his mother could not help hearing? But the sickle sang on without ceasing. The baby whimpered a little, and now and then sucked a thumb and looked up into the sky. On one side the clouds were dark and ugly, but farther off they were red and smiling, and above hung the deep blue of the sky in which tiny lights began to twinkle. He tried to talk to these lights, and said, Ta-ta, and Baba, and then he stretched out a fat little hand and tried to seize some of them, but could not reach far enough. Then he tried to sit up in order to get nearer to them, but only sank deeper into the straw, and an ear of corn fell right across his face. The little fat hand managed to grasp the ear and fling it aside, but the entire expression of the baby face was one of rage. It was allowable to be overwhelmed by one's own misfortune, and he gave vent to a wailing scream. But his mother went on reaping. She was dreading having to stand erect when she had finished. 
The baby grew quiet once more. His eyes widened, but he did not know that the stars up there were reflected in them. A semicircle of gold had risen from behind the dark hills in the east. It was so very, very bright, and once more he stretched out his hands. He forgot that his legs were cold, and stretched them up too. It was as if his whole body were ready to fly up there and play. At last the semicircle seemed to have a face like grandmother's, and when the baby was sure of this, he began to laugh. Now his mother set up the last sheaf, and, with one hand on her back and the other over her eyes, straightened herself. She staggered a little, and then walked with uncertain steps to the heap of straw on which her baby lay, and, taking him up, seated herself to nurse him. She sank farther and farther into the soft straw, while the sheaves supported her back, and her baby forgot both the moon and the clouds as she held him to her warm breast. "'Poor little fellow,' she murmured, trying to smile down at him, but every now and again her eyelids closed. The moon above the eastern hills had turned a silvery white, and the dewy fields sparkled in its light, while the air was filled with a scent of ripe corn and damp earth. But the weary woman, sitting there alone, only wished that someone could carry her home. Now, as she nursed her baby, her own hunger seemed to become greater, and her back to ache more, but she wrapped the woolen shawl more closely about the little one, and raised her eyes to rest them on the peaceful landscape before her, the fertile countryside in the blue evening twilight, with light upon light shining out from the farm surround, the cornfield in which she sat, the dark forest-clad hills that she loved. It was a relief to her that the sounds and odors of the sea did not reach her here. She had passed the seventeen years of her married life on the coast, but had lived her earlier life in a valley, among forests and mountains, and was now as little reconciled with her life by the sea as she had been on the first day of it. She no longer made any complaint, but tried to do the work of two in order to keep morbid thoughts out of her mind. Her husband, Christophe Miran, was still the handsomest man in the district, but he was out on the sea the greater part of the year, chaining her to a life on the wild, barren shore, and filling her with such fear and unrest during the long winter nights that it was all she could do to restrain her impulse to flee from it all. For him and their six children the grey cottage out there was home, but it would never be hers. She was as homesick now as she had been all through the first year of her married life. She might do the work of two or three, but she never succeeded in working herself into a feeling of home. The sea, with its terrible howling storms that raged all through the winter, the waves that day and night thundered and foamed upon the sand and seaweed foamed, too, in her mind and made her sleepless, and would one day, she felt, rob her of a reason. They were long, long years. She looked forward to the day when Christophe would sell his boats and house, move with her and the children up into the valley, and take to farming. They could never be worse off than they were now, Every winter he risked his life upon the Lofoten Sea, and if one year the fishing was good, it was eaten up by the seven bad years, and they were always in poverty. But to hope to draw him from the sea to the land was like trying to change a fish into a bird, and he turned the children's minds in his direction. The eldest boy, Lars, was only sixteen, but he wanted to go to Lofoten next winter, and Olaf, who was fourteen in the spring, talked of nothing else. She was like a hen with a brood of ducklings, vainly calling and enticing them away from the water. After a time she rose, and binding the baby firmly to her back with a shawl, set off with a tin can in one hand and her sickle in the other. Before her lay the wide field, and the stubble rustled under her feet as she walked. Her long shadow kept pace by her side, and behind her was left a dark trail through the moon-whitened dew. Her kerchief had again slipped back, 
and her pale face looked still paler in the moonlight. The knowledge that the day's work is done, and the walking over a level cornfield with the baby on one's back, give an easier carriage to a woman, even if she is tired. As she passed the cluster of buildings at Lindegård, there were lights behind white curtains in a long row of windows. She could hear the tones of a piano, and over the high garden walls floated the fragrant scent of apples and all kinds of flowers. Within those windows people lived a brighter, safer existence than a fisherman can ever attain to. Then began the barren peat bog, with its pools of stagnant water, which she always dreaded in the dark. Before her lay the wide fjord, overshadowed by the western mountains and crossed by a broad path of moonlight in which the waves rose and fell unceasingly. Down on the beach lay the fishermen's cottages, with lights in their windows, and the smell of peat smoke began as usual to make her feel sick. She could hear the waves now. Shwee, shwish, shwee, shwush. It was as though the sea were always mad and foaming at the mouth, and when she was very tired, she felt almost as if she must do the same. There was an odor of rotting seaweed in the air, of salt sand, of fish, of tarred boats, and of wet nets hung up to dry, an atmosphere in which she always had a headache and coughed and had a difficulty in breathing. There was a light in a window in Miran, the little home by the sea, and she covered her eyes with her hand, for it was hard that those whom she loved should live in a place that she detested. The baby on her back was asleep, notwithstanding that his little head in its hood nodded this way and that at every step. Now she discovered, however, that the two cows and the four sheep were still tethered in the field. Here was more work for her to do, and once more she put her hand over her eyes, as if in a feeling of dizziness. A pleasant warmth met her as she opened the door and entered. A tallow candle was burning on the table, a clock in a brightly painted case ticked on the south wall, against which stood a broad bed, and a similar bed stood against the west wall. A spinning wheel and a loom took up a great deal of the floor space, and on the two window sills stood pots of red geraniums. Three children jumped up from the floor where they were playing and ran toward her with cries of, Mother! Mother! And hanging on to her skirt, and all talking at once, they told her that Grandmother had come on a visit. The bedroom door opened, and an old woman with a pock-marked face, a big nose, and hollow cheeks came out. It was Kadi Miran, Maria's mother-in-law, who lived in the house. "'You're late,' she said, looking at Maria through her spectacles. "'Oh, yes, it is late.' The face of another old woman appeared behind the first, with smaller features and a bristly chin. This was Maria's own mother, Lava Rutosen, who had come down from the valley on a visit. "'Good evening,' she said, coming forward and shaking hands when Maria had laid the baby in the cradle. "'Good evening, mother. So you've come all this way, have you?' The two grandmothers could sit all day boiling coffee on the stove in the bedroom, and talking of things new and old, and of their rheumatism and the pains in their chests, but in all other respects they were as different as night and day. The old woman at Miran was accustomed to look to the sea and to Providence for everything, and therefore she would often sit with her hands in her lap, seeing things that others could not see. Was it the sea or Providence that she saw? The other grandmother was accustomed to the daily toil up in the valley. She had brought up five children on a small mountain farm, and she held that by picking cranberries or making birch brooms, but if you relied only on providence and wind and weather, both your pocket and the larder would be empty. Maria noticed that there was no supper prepared. The two old women had probably had so much to talk about that they had quite forgotten both her and the cows. "'Where are Lars and Olaf?' she asked. "'They went to fetch Pete,' 
said her mother-in-law. It's odd that they aren't back yet. Maria sighed, and after saying a few words to her mother, had to go out to put the animals in the cowshed. Outside the north wind had risen, and from the beach came the perpetual sound of the waves. It was as though they were plotting some evil in the darkness. Shwee! Shwish! Shwee! Shwish! End of chapter one. Two. The wheelbarrow appeared first, and then the man who was pushing it before him. He limped so that even the squeaking of the wheel sounded uneven and halting. The front view of the man showed a broad-shouldered body and a small, weather-beaten face surrounded by a quantity of black hair and beard, and surmounted by a red-pointed woolen cap with its tassel dangling down over one ear. Some little boys burning seaweed on the beach could see him from behind, however, and he had legs as well, one shorter than the other. He seemed to be sailing in a rough sea, and if it had only been winter, the broad back of his waistcoat would have made a splendid target for a snowball, or a still broader and better would have been the seat of his trousers with his knife in its sheath hanging from its waistband. It was all awry, and the patches, one above another, put one in mind of little fields. The trousers' legs lay in folds like a concertina, and hung down over the tabs of his high boots. "'Hello, Jakob! Hello! Damn it all with a limp!' "'Be quiet, boys,' was all he said, and passed on with his barrow. It was, in fact, Jakob and the nickname had been given him because he so often said, Damn it all, when he swore, and when he said it, he generally swung out his short leg. But the little boys looked up to him because he was the head man on the big Lofoten boat, the sea flower, and had gone through so much both on the sea and on land that it was a miracle that he still lived. When a lad had taken hire with him for a Lofoten voyage, the lad's mother would cross herself in horror at the thought that he could go with Jakob. Jakob was a great seaman, a great fisherman, and a great drinker, and while the other seamen lived in the grey cottages around the bay, and had wife and children to provide for, he was a happy bachelor of sixty, and his boat was wife and house and home to him. It is true that the sea flower lay unrigged high up on the beach half the year, but even then Jakob lived on board, in the poop cabin, and while the others toiled at the herring fisheries in the summer and autumn, he led an easy life from the end of one winter's fishing to the beginning of the next. And it is wonderful how quickly the days pass when you have learned how to sleep at any hour of the twenty-four. When smoke was seen rising from the stovepipe through the roof of the poop cabin, you knew that Jakob was awake, and if you wanted a dram, you had only to climb on board. He no longer had any relatives in the district, but when he set out to sea he always waved a southwester vigorously, although there was no one on shore to say goodbye to him and wish him a prosperous voyage. And in the spring he joined the others and sailed the hundreds of miles southward again, although no one among the many standing on the beach was there to welcome him home. But what did that matter? They got on well here, both the sea flower and Jakob, and today he came limping along in the sunshine with his wheelbarrow and was not even drunk. Over the sunlit surface of the sea the wind was flinging patches of ruffled blue. All round the bay between the two headlands stood grey boathouses, and out of the back of two or three of these stuck the pitch-brown forepart of a Lofoten boat, as if to watch for the coming of the season when it would go out and be rigged again. The sea-flower, however, lay alone on the beach, with no boathouse to cover her, as homeless as Jakob himself, her long hull with a white stripe along the sheer strake, and the black stem and stern standing proudly erect. Herring nets hung drying beside the boathouses, for there may be a herring or two to be caught by those who have the mind and the patience to catch them, 
but Jacob, with his wheelbarrow, held such fishing in contempt. Suddenly the noise of the wheel ceased. Jacob had stopped and was gazing out over the bay. A boat was sailing up past the southern headland. She was certainly no herring boat, nor yet a ten-oared or a four-oared boat. Neither was she a cargo boat. Why, damn it all, if she wasn't a Lofoten boat! Such an object on the sea at this season of the year was like lightning in a cloudless sky. It was incredible, and yet there she was, and had a six-oared boat without a sail in tow as well. Jakob put down the wheelbarrow and stood staring, without even noticing that there was someone behind him who was also standing staring. It was Eleseus Hulla, a broad-shouldered, brown-bearded man with prominent cheekbones, and he stared so intently that a row of white teeth became visible from sheer wonderment. "'Can you understand that?' he said, burying his hands deep in his trousers' pockets. His blouse was of white sailcloth, and his homespun trousers hung down over his boots, just as Jakob's did. The old man turned his head, removed his quid from his mouth to his waistcoat pocket, and expectorated. "'No,' he said. "'Can you? It must be a stranger.' Perhaps, but it seems to me that I know the six-oared boat. The windows in the cottages had become full of faces, and a few people came out in order to get a better view. On the Miran land, two fair-haired boys were taking up potatoes. They were Lars and his brother Ulf, and both stood leaning on their forks and gazing. I'm going down to the water, said Ulf. You'll stay where you are said Lars, for he was sixteen and the other only fourteen, and what would the world be like if the younger brother were not to obey the elder? The brothers were very dissimilar in appearance, Lars being bow-legged and round-shouldered, and with a quick temper, while Ulf was big and broad, and had his mother's short upper lip, so that his mouth was always open. "'He's coming into our boathouse!' cried Ulf dropping his fork and setting off at a run. The next moment his brother ran past him. "'It's father!' he shouted. "'You'll see, he's bought a Lofoten boat!' It was Christophe and Miram, and this was a great day for him. For many years he had secretly longed for it, and at last it had come, and he stood there, the headman on his own Lofoten boat. It was altogether incredible— but the tiller that he swung backward and forward over his head was his. The hull, rigging, grapnel, and rope, everything on board belonged to him. The sturdy fisherman was still in the prime of his life. His red, close-clipped beard and whiskers surrounded a strong face, and the hair beneath the black southwester was fair and curly. It was not unusual when he walked up the aisle in church for great ladies to put up their eyeglasses in order to have a better look at him. But the fisherman with a wife and six children has other things to think about than being handsome. The purchase of the boat had come about in a strange manner. He was fishing the fjords for herring in his six-oared boat with Cornelis Gumol, and one day went over to an auction at which he had heard a large boat was to be sold. He had no thought of any purchase, but there were crowds of people on the beach, and the auctioneer was shouting, but not a soul attempted to bid. And there lay the boat. Christophe began to walk around her. He thought he ought to be able to judge of the capabilities of such a boat, and she was apparently as good as new, well built with extra fine lines, a regular sea plough to cleave the billows and forge ahead with. What could it be that kept people from bidding for such a fine boat? It happened that there was a man there who could not hold his tongue, and he let out the fact that the boat had capsized three winters in succession on the Lofoten Sea, and now had the reputation of being a regular coffin in which no one would sign on. She was, moreover, a slow sailor, and dropped behind the others in the voyages north and south, 
so that no headman with any self-respect would think of bidding for such a tub. At this Christaver took courage and bid them mere nothing, and he turned cold for a moment when the boat was knocked down to him, and he, a poor man, stood there, the sole owner of a Lufoten boat. "'Do you want to kill yourself?' said one man with a smile, and every one in the crowd gazed at him, apparently with the same thought. A headman from a coast district cannot resist the temptation to tease the dwellers in the inland fjord districts who like to think themselves seamen, so he answered that the boat was good enough, but that much depended upon the fellows that were on board her. Whereupon the men began to close in upon him and ask him what he meant by that. A spirit of mischief impelled him to reply that the boat was far too good for such inlanders who were good enough to dig potatoes up out of the ground, but would never make seamen. "'I'll show you that I can make her go,' he added. "'Aye, and make her stand up, too.' But if he had not taken his departure then, it is probable that blows would have been exchanged. Now he was coming home. He had been a headman for many years, so that was not what made the difference, but he had been only part owner in the boat— and what is the good of a successful fishing season once in a way when the proceeds have to be divided between six men? Christaver had sons who were growing up, and his head was full of plans, and if the day ever came when he could man his own boat from his own household, a single good fishing year might make him a wealthy man. He owed for the boat, that is true, and would have to go still deeper into debt if he alone had to equip six men for a winter's fishing. It was foolhardy, but he had taken the plunge, and what was done could not be undone. "'Lower away!' he shouted to Cornelis, who was standing forward, and the topsail bellied out, sank together, and glided down, followed by the mainsail. The grapnel clanked over the side, and the big boat swung round to the hawser, and lay along the wind. The beach was black with people, and when the six-oared boat had also been moored and the skiff came shoreward, but was still at some distance, it was Lars who shouted, "'Who does the Lofoten boat belong to, father?' Christopher made no answer. His face was all smiles when he stepped ashore, and two of his younger children seized each a hand, and he stooped down and talked to them although every one all around him was trying to speak to him. Then he went slowly up the beach with the children, nodding affirmatively in all directions. Yes, the boat was his. Jacob alone held aloof and would not condescend to be curious. He looked grim and tried to find out whether the boat was a thing to go to sea with. We'll be able to race one another now, said Gristaver as he passed him. Down through the field a woman was coming toward him with hesitating steps, carrying a baby on her arm. It was Maria. "'Welcome home,' she said, with an attempt at a smile, but the eyes in the pale face had a frightened look. Christaver walked slowly beside her, only asking if everything was going on all right. He thought there was no one like her, and that she had a perfect right to her own thoughts and opinions. Two boys had already rowed out to the Lofoten boat, and they were Lars and Olaf. Cornelis Gumon, who had been with Christaver on this herring fishing expedition, was a bachelor of thirty. He was little and pale, and had it not been for his fair moustache, would have been taken for a mere boy. He was now walking up from the shore into the mountains, singing as he went, swaying from side to side and carrying his chest on his shoulder. His home was on a little mountain farm, where there lived only his half-blind father of seventy, and a little sister, who was not yet confirmed. If only he had been able to cultivate the land at home, he might have made a large farm of it, but that needed a little money, and if he did not earn that on the sea, he would like to know where it was to come from. He was unsuccessful, however, year after year, so there was nothing but toil when he was away, and poverty at home. 
but still Cornelis sang. The priest never failed to put him down as father in every case of doubtful paternity in the parish, and, though it might be amusing for the priest, it became by degrees a heavy tax on Cornelis. But still he was as happy as a king, and was always singing the gayest of songs. There was much talk in the cottage at Miran all that evening, first about the boat and father, and then about father and the boat. Even the little ten-year-old Tosten had been on board, and he determined that his own little boat, which was as large as a wooden shoe, should be called the seal after the big boat. Lars had extracted from his father the promise that next winter he should at last be allowed to go with him, and this caused him to assume a still more authoritative manner toward Ulf, for now he was almost a Lofoten fisherman. There was not much sleep for any one in the little cottage that night. There was only one person who had not yet said anything, and that was Maria, and she lay awake beside Kristaver, but pretended to be asleep. He himself was thinking of the guarantors he would have to find for his bank loan, and of all that he must try to obtain on credit from the tradesmen here and in town. To fit out six men is no small matter, and if then it was a black year with the fishing, it would be pretty well the ruin of him and his. And then, about the seal, the thought that he had acted like a fool kept flitting through his mind. If the boat had capsized with others, why should he be better able to keep her right way up? Was not that merely a boast? And would he dare to take his eldest boy with him in such a venture? He smiled at this, however. Boats are like horses and women. They have their whims and caprices, and the question is whether you are man enough to overcome them. There was nothing wrong with the boat, nothing at any rate that could not be put right. And he repeated, I'll show you that I can make her go, ay, and make her stand up too. But what would Maria have said if she knew? Lars slept in the attic with Ulf, and lay thinking until he fell asleep, and then dreamed until he started up wide awake again. Ulf slept on undisturbed, for he knew no better, but it was not easy to be Lars. He felt drawn in many different directions. At school he had been a regular clipper, and it was jolly to learn things, there was no doubt about that. Both the schoolmaster and the priest had advised him to try to borrow money and take a teacher's course. It was a great temptation. He would like to rise and get on in the world, and whenever he and his mother were alone together, she always impressed upon him that that was the way he ought to take. But his father was a Lofoten fisherman and a headman, and he would like to be like his father, too. He had never forgotten what the pastor's wife had once said to him. I know now what Olaf Tryggvason looked like. He was just exactly like your father. He remembered now, too, what the schoolmaster had once said about the Stadsland Lofoten boat. She was the descendant of the old dragon-proud vessels which hundreds and hundreds of years ago bore the Vikings to their discoveries and battles all over the world, and the fishermen of today still sails in the same kind of boat the hundreds of miles northward to battle with wind and wave. Lars would certainly be just what his father was. He slept and dreamed that he was fighting in the battle of Svolder. His father was Olav Tryggvason, and he himself was Einar Tamborshalver. He drew a bow with a stronger hand than others, and his bow broke. What was that that broke with such clangor? asked Ulf. Norway from thy grasp, O king, said Lars, and he started up in bed, and there lay that duffer Ulf fast asleep. The next day, while they were at dinner, Ulf said, But the boat hasn't got the pennon, father. Aren't you going to have a red pennon on the masthead like all the others? His father replied that he had thought of speaking to Karin Seamstress about it. Maria looked up at him. Oh, you might entrust that little piece of work to me, she said, 
her face brightening. "'Well, there's no one who could do it better,' he said. Maria had a piece of red material that was just large enough to make a petticoat for herself, and the same day she took it out and cut off a piece about a foot wide and a good two feet in length for the pennon, and then hunted up some bright blue woolen yarn, and set to work to embroider a K and an M upon the red ground. She worked away with a happy face, because they were his initials, but at the same time she felt inclined to cry. One day she dressed herself in her best, and telling the children to be good, set off up the road with a rope in her hand. She was going up to her brother's, in the valley, to fetch home a cow that had been up there on the mountain pastures all the summer. Her mother had given her the cow as a calf, and every spring since she had taken it up there for the summer, and every autumn brought it down again. It was a strange expedition both for the cow and for her. When they set out from the little farm by the sea, Russia would turn her handsome white head over her shoulder to look back at the houses and lo. She had stood in the cowshed there all the winter, and it was her home. Maria thought of the children, so it was not easy for her to leave it either. When they had come farther in toward the valley, however, Russia began to scent the mountain air that she knew from the long, bright days on the setter pastures, and her step grew lighter, she whimpered and quickened her pace. Maria, too, forgot the children and the cottage by the sea and walked more easily, for she was on her way home to the only place in the world where she was happy. On this occasion her mind was full of all the bustle down by the sea, but when she had passed Lindegord, and the valley lay before her in the hot autumn sunshine, with its farms and woods, where bright patches of scarlet leafage stood out here and there from the deep green of the fir-clad hills, she breathed more freely, and her step grew lighter. Farther on, the valley began to close in and become more sheltered. The river gleamed far below, and the hills came nearer, as if to welcome her and she sat down on a stone and wiped the tears from her eyes. By evening she had reached the little farm where her mother lived as a pensioner of her brother. The small sun-browned buildings were surrounded with green and yellow fields, the whole forming a picture in its setting of green forest. Maria could hardly imagine anything more beautiful. The night was frosty, with bright moonlight, and she lay listening to the wind in the trees, but heard no sound of waves, and she folded her hands and prayed, for here she felt there was a good God. Down by the sea he stood only for the day of judgment, storm, misfortune, and terror, and she did not pray there. She set her teeth and defied him. The next day they went down together, she and the big red cow with the white head and beautiful horns tipped with brass buttons. The cow turned and lowed her farewell, and was answered by her comrades in the cowhouse. Maria, too, walked sadly, for she was turning her back on home. As she went down the valley, her eyes rested lovingly on the mountains and wooded slopes. Then came the wide countryside, where it was still beautiful. Then Linda Gord and beyond that were the peat-bogs and the sea. But here Russia raised her head, and sniffed the well-known air of her little winter home by the sea, and instantly her step grew lighter. Maria thought of the children, and wondered if anything had happened to them while she was away, and she quickened her pace as the cow had done. And so they reached the field, the cow lowing softly, and Maria calling to the children to ask if all had gone well at home. End of chapter 2 3. If Christaver had to go the round of the countryside and beg people to become guarantors for a bank loan, he would have to make a special occasion of it. He had shrunk from it and put it off as long as possible, but one day a letter came from the bailiff of the inland parish to say that if he did not pay for the boat at once, he would send men to fetch it away again. 
One cold, windy November day he set out on his errand. He would not go to Brandt at Lindegård, or to any of the well-to-do farmers in the farming district. He would have to keep to the cottagers out on the shore, for the poor are the readiest to give help to one another. Many a night when he lay awake he had gone over his comrades in his mind, and now he weighed and considered them in a manner he had not done before. One was a good-for-nothing, to whom he would be under no obligation, another a miser, a third a sanctimonious fellow who would manage to get rid of him with a flood of pious phrases. But here and there among them a face would appear before his mind's eye that ordinarily was all smiles and gaiety, but which nevertheless held his attention, for perhaps, after all, its owner might be more obliging than most. There was a little red house with a grey cowshed beside it, out by the wood below Lindegord, where his sister lived with her husband, Alessio's Hilla. Relatives are not always the first one would apply to, however, and besides, Alessio's was one of those who look to see whether their wives use too much cream and coffee when they are away, and he often beat her black and blue. And yet no one could be angry with him long for among his comrades he was a capable man both on land and sea. He was chopping wood in the shed when Christavert came, and they went at once indoors. Berit appeared from the kitchen, and on this occasion was neither black nor blue, and she even ventured to bring the kettle in and put it on the stove, although her husband sat looking on. There were plants on the window sills behind the little white curtains, and there was a spicy smell from the juniper, with which the floor was strewn. Christavus sat down by the door and lighted his pipe. He told story after story, and laughed heartily, finding it all the time becoming more and more difficult to say what he had come for. Berit looked at him, and thought he was not like himself. Her cheeks were hollow, but red, and her beautiful golden hair was twisted into a large knot at the back of her neck. She had married Alessus only because she had had a child by another man. "'Is it true, after all, what people say?' she asked, as she spread a cloth on the table. "'Say? Have people anything special to talk about just now?' he asked. "'Yes,' she replied, "'that you've inherited such a lot of money from America.' "'I? From America?' "'Yes, and that it's with that money that you've bought your boat.' Ah, was that how matters stood? And Alessio sat staring at him, his large eyes standing almost out of his head with curiosity, and his white teeth gleaming beneath his brown moustache. It was so funny, so irresistibly funny, that in a spirit of mischief Christavert did not contradict the story. Ah, yes, he said, it's strange how things sometimes happen. More than this, however, he would not say at present. As they sat drinking coffee, Elesu suggested that he should go with him to Lofoten in the winter, and Christavert answered that was just what he had come about, and he should certainly go with him. Elesu did not stop here, however. He said he had been thinking of having nets of his own, so as to have a whole share in the fishing, but he needed a guarantor. Did he? Well, Christavid was quite willing to back a bill for him, of course. When he left the house, he burst into a laugh. I'm a fool, and a fool I always shall be, he said to himself. It wasn't exactly to have fun that I came out today. Inside the cottage, Elesus was walking up and down excitedly. Now you can see, he said to his wife, wasn't I right? He has inherited money. Isn't it wonderful how things go for some people? Perhaps it's some thousands. You'll see, he'll be buying a large farm soon, and begin to drive about in a four-wheeled carriage. Ha, <laughs> ha! You must go down this evening and ask him to lend us the money to buy a cow with. No, indeed, I won't, she said. You'll have to do that yourself. You won't? Is that the way you answer me? You'd better take care. You'd better take care. Christavert trudged on in the cold north wind, 
going in to one after another of his acquaintances, but always meeting with a refusal. Andreas Ekra was a well-to-do man, headman on the Stormbird, and had shared a hut with Kristaver for many years, but he said no. People seemed to think that it didn't do to be too open-handed when you hadn't a penny to do it with. Kristaver's knees seemed to grow weaker as he went from house to house, leaving each with a fresh refusal. He held his hat on with one hand and swung the other vigorously. He had the whole day for the business, and would have to put up with a few more refusals. A man was coming toward him in a white blouse and a southwester, his left hand deep in his trouser pocket. He had a goatee, and as he walked his right shoulder was in advance of his left. It was Peter Susansa, the headman on the sea fire. "'Are you out this windy day?' he said, stopping. He spoke with a nasal twang. Yes, Kristaver was just out for a walk. They both stood, as fishermen generally do, looking out to sea, which was greyish-white under the north wind. Peter Shusansa had the reputation of lying as readily as a horse trots. He told the most dreadful stories with the most serious face, and no one believed a word of them. He was now over sixty, and his beard was grey. He had recently lost his wife and had an unmarried daughter living with him who was awaiting her confinement. Today he was looking old. As they stood there, Kristaver, despite everything, forced himself to ask his assistance in the matter of the bank loan. And after all it was Peter, who had had so much trouble lately, who now said that he thought it might be managed. When they parted, Kristaver walked with a lighter step, but he still had to have another name. He met with several refusals afterward, but they were easier to bear now. As twilight fell he drew near to two little red houses up by the peat bogs. They belonged to Henry Rabben, a man of a rather different type from the others in the neighborhood. No one could explain why it was that everyone looked up to him. He was a fisherman and a farm laborer like the others, had no more learning than they, and was in possession of no great wealth. But, however much noise might be going on in a room when he entered it, it instantly became quiet, and everyone in it was ready to make room for him. He was of medium height and broad-shouldered. On weekdays he went about in patched clothes like his neighbors, but his dark brown beard was always carefully combed, and his yellow mustache separated from it, and brushed out to each side. He had a large nose and large eyes. He spoke little, but smiled when he did speak, and the more he smiled, the more serious was the expression of his eyes. When he was out fishing, he would occasionally snuff up a baler full of seawater, because he said it was wholesome. He cultivated his little patch of land better than anyone else, and was the only man in the neighborhood that had a garden in front of his house, with bushes and flowers in it. When Kristaver came, Henry was winnowing corn in the barn. "'You've come just when I was in need of you,' he said with a smile, as he brushed the corn dust out of his beard. "'For I suppose you'll need a half-share man this winter, won't you?' Kristaver recollected now that Henry was one of a boat's company that had been run down by a steamer the winter before in the middle of the night, and had lost both nets and boat. It was sad to think that this capable man would now have to go out as a common half-share man. That was just what he had come about, said Kristaver once more. Would it do to ask Henry to be a guarantor after all his losses? Kristaver was tired, and did not feel equal to going to any more acquaintances now, and when he made his request the tears were not far from his eyes. Henry considered, and pulled his moustaches only for a moment, and then his answer was, Yes. He shan't be the loser by that, said Kristaver to himself, when at last he turned homeward with the knowledge that his boat was saved. End of chapter 3
4. The snowflakes were already beginning to float down over Blue Hill in the north, and the days were dark and gloomy. The roads leading to the village shop resounded with the tramp of iron heels, as the fishermen flocked to it like birds of passage assembling in preparation for their long journey. They all looked more or less alike, in their white canvas blouse, black felt hat with a brim as wide as an umbrella, and grey homespun trousers that below hung down over the tops of their boots. Some, however, wore red woolen caps with a tassel that dangled over one ear. They went first to the shop on the nearer side of the bridge, which they filled, packed closely, shoulder to shoulder, while the hump-backed shopman behind the counter darted about hither and thither in the lamplight, taking things down from shelves and wrapping them up in wrong order. Occasionally he received money in exchange, which he threw into the till, but most of the purchases had to be entered in a long book to which a pencil was attached by a piece of string. Those customers whose purchases, as entered in the books, were of one and two years standing, preferred to keep in the background and make remarks about the weather, but they were obliged to come forward in the end. They all wanted credit for sacks of flour, tobacco, rye cake packed in brand new casks, kegs of treacle, barrels of coffee, leather, and paraffin. They were almost all in debt from the year before but they were all expecting that this time the Lofoten fisheries would both free them from that and make them wealthy, for this year would surely be a good year. The hump-backed man behind the counter looked at them one after another. If they did not get what they wanted from him, they would go to his rival on the other side of the bridge, and if they got it there, they would go there first when they had something to pay with. The village shops, however, did not keep everything the fishermen wanted, so most of them sailed up the fjord through the falling snow to the town. On the wharves all around the harbour there were little shops where everything necessary for a fisherman's outfit could be obtained, oil skins, rope, twine for nets, hooks, etc., down to writing paper for Lofoten letters. Heavy sea boots, wet with mud and snow, stamped in here, and the fog from outside floated in through the door, to which a bell was attached. Behind the counter, with his back to a wall, on which there was a great display of rope and twine, stood a sturdy man, dressed in homespun and high boots, his face, beard, and clothes all bearing traces of flour, tar, and treacle. This was Utnes, and he had once been a fisherman himself. Christaver and Peter Susansa met here, when the shop was full of men from both inland and coast districts, all wanting their Lofoten outfit on credit. Very well, Utnes was saying to a little red-bearded man, but this must really be the last time. The gas over the counter was lighted, and the bell on the door kept on ringing, and many had been standing for hours without having stated their errand. At last Utnes's eye fell on Peter Susansa, who was standing there with one hand in his pocket, and his shoulder thrust forward. "'What do you want?' "'Well, I should like the whole shop,' said Peter, with his nasal twang, his face quite serious. Utnes could not help smiling, for Peter Susansa owed for several years, but it was cheering to the others standing round to find that someone was able to make the great man behind the counter drop his shop expression. Peter said he would have liked everything that was to be had there, and would have paid cash down, but, unfortunately, he had forgotten to bring any change, so he would have to be content with rather less. And he thereupon gave a list of all the things he must have. It was not easy to say no to a man who made the whole shop full of people laugh. Again the bell rang as the door opened to admit Jacob. He had been taken up the evening before for being drunk, and had spent the night at the police station, but now he was out again, and had come to do business. There was certainly no false modesty about him. He pushed noisily into the counter, and began to express his horror at all the poisonous, ill-natured things people can say. 
What's up now? asked Utnes. Why, there are those rascally fellows going about and saying that things are so much better at Larsen's down on the quay. I gave them a thrashing yesterday, and got a night's free lodging for it, but now, damn it all, you'll have to let me have some rope and twine for taking your part. Utnes shook his head doubtfully. He knew Jacob was lying, but even that was better than when men leaned over the counter and quoted scripture when they wanted credit. But Christaver wanted to buy a good deal, and Utnes opened his eyes wide. Christaver wanted things for five men. Yes, it is easy enough for you when you can afford to buy a Lofoten boat, said Peter Shusansa, and this Utnes heard as it was probably intended he should. He took it in. Christaver looked like a man who would pay his way. When their purchases were made, the men sailed back down the fjord, through the falling snow. There would be plenty to do now before Christmas. The living room at Miran was full during those evenings, and the smoking lamp shed its dull yellow light upon many busy hands. At one side of the room sat Lars and Olaf, trying which of them could net codnet the quickest, while Christaver sat at another, putting the edge onto the nets. The ten-year-old Tosten and little Jonetta, who was six, were sitting on the floor, fully occupied in filling the netting shuttles with twine. Maria was hard at work knitting two thick woolen jerseys for the Lofoten men to wear over their woolen and cotton shirts, and they had blue and red rings around the sleeves and waist. Even the old grandmother, with spectacles on, was busy, and sat by the stove dipping the new woolen gloves and socks into hot soapy water, and rubbing them upon a fluted board so that they would become matted and be thick and warm. "'Your feet will be nice and warm,' she said to Lash, showing him one of the socks she was working at. Then they had the shoemaker in the house, and when Lars stood in his new soft sea boots that could fall down over the knee, but could also be pulled right up the thigh, he requested Ulf to get out of the way so that he could have room to move. And just at that moment his father brought in a large bag from the porch and threw it across to him, and out of it appeared a new shining southwester and a yellow oilskin coat that smelled very fresh and was so sticky that his fingers almost stuck to it. "'My word!' said Olaf, staring with all his eyes. "'Hold your jaw,' said Lars, for there was still a large leather skirt to draw down over the tops of his boots. When at last he had put on all his finery, he looked quite like a warrior in full armor and it was silly of that little donkey Yonetta to come just then and tease him by asking him to come out and run races. There followed some clear, windless, frosty evenings, which turned the road up through the ravine into a sinuous ribbon of shining ice, which went up and up until it was lost in the very sky itself. It was a grand time for tobogganing, and when Lars left his netting, and went out on to the doorstep, and heard the shouts and laughter on the hills, and saw the trail of sparks when the iron under the runners of a sledge passed over a stone or a patch of sand, it was not easy for him to resist joining in the sport. He was a Lofoten man now, it was true, but on the other hand he had a sledge that was called the Lightning, because it went so much faster than all the others and before he knew what he was about, he had stolen round to the outhouse, and in another moment was racing up the hills with a sledge at his heels, without having told Ulf. At the foot of the hills the boys and girls collected, and went up again all together, and Lars had friends enough all over the neighborhood. There was lanky Peter Rönningan, who stammered, and could never pass for confirmation because he was so stupid. The others called him Peter Galeas. Martin Bruvol was called Martin Furrag, and they called Lars Bright Eyes, and Olavus Koya Dear Death. 
There were large and small sledges, and girls of about the same age as the boys, not mere children, nor yet quite grown up. As they hurried up the hill, talking busily, there came a shout from higher up out of the darkness. Hello! Clear the road! And a sledge flew past, with many feet sticking out on both sides, and shouts from their owners. After half an hour's climbing, they had reached the dark hills right up under the stars, from which they could see the fjord far below, beneath the mountains in the west with here and there upon its surface a ship's lantern, and farther east their own district, dotted all over with the lights from the fishermen's cottages as far out as Lindegord. Three or four of the company placed themselves upon the largest sledges, where Martin Bruvold sat farthest forward to steer with his feet. The girls shrieked with mingled terror and delight as they started, and the speed grew faster and faster. The wind cut their faces and went through their bodies. The sledge rounded a curve on one runner, and in another curve nearly flew off into a broad ditch, but escaped it. On it went in the darkness, faster and faster, as the road grew steeper. On the middle of the last hill something black appeared that did not make way for them. "'It's a horse!' was the despairing shout from all on the sledge, but it was impossible to stop, and on one side of the road there was the rocky cliff, and on the other blocks of stone to mark the edge of the road, and beyond them a deep ditch. The horse reared and snorted, and the man holding the rein swore and shouted, but the sledge dashed past at the side of the road and disappeared in the darkness, leaving a fiery trail behind it. Just as the man was about to drive on, he heard more shouting, and ran forward to hold the horse's head, but he slipped on the ice and fell full length as the second sledge flew past. It was not every one that Lars would have with him on the lightning. This evening it was Ellen Koya, although he and she had not been the best of friends of late, one reason being that she was always such a tease. Other people teased them both, however, declaring that they had been married some years before and were man and wife. The wedding had taken place in the barn at Koya one Sunday in the summer, when the children had assembled to play. One suggested that they should play at entertaining guests, another that Ellen and Lars should be bride and bridegroom. A door was laid upon a barrel to represent the altar, and Martin Bruvol, draped in a tarpaulin, was the priest and the next moment Ellen and Lars were standing in front of the altar, with downcast eyes, like a real bride and bridegroom. The bride was then only twelve, and was dressed in a blue check dress. A wreath of buttercups rested upon her fair hair, above a face that was then, as now, pretty and pink, but no one could see her large blue eyes, for she never raised her eyelids, and stood with folded hands while the other children sang, the voice that breathed over Eden. Lars Christoffersen Miran, said the priest, wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife? Yes, said Lars. This was fun, and a thrill ran through him at the thought that he was now grown up and was being married. I likewise ask thee, Ellen Ull's daughter Koya, if thou wilt have this man, Lars Christoffersen Miran, to thy wedded husband. Yes, answered Ellen, still looking down with folded hands. Will you be faithful to one another? Yes, said both Ellen and Lars. Then join hands in token thereof, said Martin, and they joined hands, and Martin placed his upon their heads and blessed them after which they had coffee and refreshments and dancing, just as at any grown-up wedding in the barn. The next time they met was on the way to school. They were a large company, and Lars did not like to look in her direction. He had to put up with the teasing from the others, but when she came and asked him to carry her books, he thought it was going too far, and he told her in so many words that he was not her husband today because he had been it yesterday. Silly, she said, tossing her head and blushing crimson. 
and thereupon he was informed that if she ever took a husband, it would not be a cad like him. A quarrel ensued, to the great amusement of the others. Poor things, they said, have matters already gone so far, and only yesterday they were standing at the altar. But from that day they preferred to ignore each other when they met. This evening they had happened to walk up side by side, and the distance between them and the others gradually increased. "'You're angry with me,' she said. "'It is you who are angry,' he returned. She laughed at this, and then he laughed too, and after that there was not much more to be said about the quarrel. "'And to think that you're a man already and are going to Lofoten,' she said. "'And you've been so ill,' he said. "'Was it inflammation of the lungs? "'Do you think it's wrong of you to be out this evening?' His thought for her touched her, and she took hold of the sledge rope to help him pull, and it was strange how near their hands felt to one another— even though they had on woolen gloves. "'You'll be writing Lofoden letters to all your sweethearts this winter, I suppose,' she said. But Lars assured her that he was not even going to take pen and ink with him. "'Oh, I like that. You are a storyteller. But I suppose it wouldn't do to write to a girl who isn't confirmed. "'No, I should be taken up and put in prison for that.' "'Hold my glove, will you, while I tie my garter?' she said. They were now far in advance of the others, and quite alone, and at the very top of the hills he took her glove and rubbed her cheeks with it, because he declared she was cold. Around them were the dark hills, and above them the stars. They seated themselves upon the sledge, and he was quite equal to steering with his feet, although she was sitting on his knees, leaning back so that he had to support her with his arm as they flew along. Once upon a bridge the lightning made a leap into the air, and was quite a long time before it came down again, but it struck the road again without flying into splinters, and they dashed on, shouting, frightening the driver of the sleigh almost out of his wits, down to the level ground, with its numerous lights shining in the darkness. Before the young people separated, they stood talking on the road at the foot of the hill for a little while. They had gone to the same school, and had played many a game together, both in winter and summer, and now they would soon be men and women. Several of the boys were going to Lofoten this winter, and the girls looked at them with the thought that they might never come back again. In any case, there was an end to games and tobogganing. A period of their life was over, and a new one was beginning in which everything would be more serious than before. As Lars went down toward Miran, he discovered that he still had one of Ellen Koya's woolen gloves in his hand. He took off his own and drew hers on, and it was really wonderful how warm and soft it was inside. Christmas came with snow and wind and as soon as it was over, the great, heavy Lofoten boats were dragged out of the boathouses. There they lay full length upon the beach, not rigged as yet, but the men were very busy getting them loaded, and shouted and made signs with their hands to one another when they had anything to say, as if they were already at sea. By the boathouse below Miran lay the seal, long and heavy, and the strangest things were being shipped in her. There were nets in barrels, food in barrels, home-brewed ale in barrels, a barrel of sour whey to mix with soup and as a drink mixed with water, a barrel of oil for the lamp in the hut, chests, boxes, and skin rugs. Most of it disappeared into the large space midships where there was room for much more. The boat looked like some good-natured animal as she lay there, letting people clamber about and do what they liked with her. Now and then the men would stop work, and the bottle would be passed around. The same activity was to be seen round the stormbird, which lay right out by Nunas, and where Andreas Ekra was headman. A little nearer lay the sea fire, where Petr Sansa was busy with his men, and nearest of all the sea flower, 
which was almost ready for sea, although Jakob limped about in a state of intoxication from morning till night. Hey ho, he said. Work away, men. Work away, lads. On the last Sunday, most of the men went to church with their wives, and even Jakob limped up more or less sober, with his upper lip shaved and looking quite blue. They all met outside the brown wooden church, whose bell rang out into the grey wintry air. People from the farms around, who had driven up in sleighs drawn by fine horses with bells on their harness, and fishermen, who had waded through the snow with their wives. Inside the church the fishermen were lost among the others, so they had appropriated a fixed space for themselves, far back under the gallery. During the singing of the hymn, many a wife from the shore district raised her eyes from her hymn book to look across at her husband sitting on the other side of the aisle, and the hymn became a little prayer for his return from the long voyage northward. The men, both old and young, looked up at the priest while he preached, but in the minds of the fishermen was the thought that God was in the wind and on the sea, and that they would soon be on their way to meet him. The day before, Eliseus Hilla had said to his wife that he thought they ought to take the sacrament this last Sunday that he was at home. Eliseus was not a religious man, but he had spells of being exceedingly good to his wife and children, and if a misfortune happened to any one in the district, it would bring tears to the eyes of at any rate one person, and that was Eliseus. On this occasion, however, as ill luck would have it, he flew into a rage with Berit again, and before he knew what he was about he had flung her against the wall and given her several blows, after which he had hurried into his clothes and gone to church, forbidding her to accompany him. When the sacrament was about to be administered, however, he was seized with such remorse that he left the church. As he walked slowly homeward before the others, he recollected how the priest had said that one day we should all have to stand face to face with God, and he felt himself to be so great a sinner that he did not know what to do. The following evening the beach was full of people, for now the boats were to be launched. First of all there was a little merrymaking in each poop cabin. The door was so small that a full-grown man could only just creep through it, and in the narrow space in front of the bunk, with its skin coverings, a fire was burning in a rusty cooking stove, upon which there now stood a pan of steaming ale. Upon the skin rugs lay and sat women and men, and bowls of hot ale and glasses of spirits went round. Men and women sang, and eyes grew moist, and Cornelis Gumon played the concertina, with a girl sitting on his knee. Lights shone from other poop windows all around the bay. Then men with lanterns came tramping in from the boats lying farthest out, and one halted. It was Jakob. The seal was to be the first boat launched, and the other boats' crews came to help. There was a cutting north wind that carried stinging snowflakes. The light of the lantern shone upon a ring of bearded faces around the boat, and when Ulf Miran succeeded in setting light to a great heap of seaweed and driftwood which he had collected, it was a bonfire that lighted up the snow and the beach and shone upon the grey waters of the fjord. An old man was led up to the spot. He had a long white beard, and wore a red woolen cap pulled down over his ears, and big white fingerless woolen gloves on his hands. It was Peter Hedman, and this was his great day, for he was still able to sing the boats into the sea. He was helped upon a large stone, and after clearing his throat and wiping his nose on his glove, he cried, Now, boys, you must all work together. Everyone was turned out of the cabin, and the men stood side by side close together, with their backs against the side of the boat, looking quite small under her great brown bow. Then Peter Hedman sang out, Here we go, oh ho, oh, oh, oh. The men strained every muscle, their faces contorted with the effort. 
The logs under the keel rolled, and the heavy boat moved, but stopped again. Peter Hedman sang on, Heave ho! Oh ho! Oh! Oh! Backs and legs stiffened again, and the boat grated along a little way. But then the men had to pause to take a breath. Lars Miran was looking at the old man with the white beard, standing in the light of the bonfire, and as he looked he thought how, many hundred years before, such an old man would have been the sacrificing priest, and the bonfire the sacrificial fire, and the people were drinking to Thor and Freya before the Lofoten boats set sail. The shore was the same, and the fjord was the same, and the mountains and the boats were as they are now and the people were probably very much the same, too. Now the old man sang in a high falsetto, There she goes! Oh, ho! Oh, oh, oh! And the next moment the great boat lay rocking upon the water. Christaver shouted his thanks to the other boat's crews for their assistance, and dealt out drams, after which the whole party passed on with their lanterns, and launched boat after boat. The old man's eyes grew moist from the effect of his numerous potations, and his heave-ho, oh-ho, oh, 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 grew louder and louder. Before the men went home to sleep their last night in a comfortable bed, they went out and moored their boats a little way from land, raised the mast, and placed the sail in readiness. Silence fell at last upon the beach. The lanterns were gone, and the fire had died down, but the four boats lay rocking on the waters of the bay, with their pennons flying from the mastheads, ready to set sail. End of chapter 4《卡内利斯·古蒙》was less fortunate than the others, for he could not possibly get up to the little mountain farm and back again in time. So we wandered about alone, where everyone else was asleep and the lights were out. He had a few drams in his head, and he whistled or sang as he walked. The frosty road was beneath his feet, and the starry sky above his head, and why should he not sing? He might, of course, go and visit some girl in an attic, but he thought of his half-blind father at home and of his little sister. God alone knew whether they would have enough food for the whole winter. And then, too, there was a girl at a large farm away in the north who thought he was sincere in his intentions and that he was the son of a rich man. Well, 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 well. There was plenty to think about on a night like this before you start on a voyage and are out singing and trying to make the time pass. At Miran, where Christaver and Maria slept in the bed against the south wall, Christaver woke in the middle of the night, and a little while after he said softly, Are you crying, Maria? Oh, no. You mustn't be so unhappy about it. He was just dropping asleep again when he felt her arms about his neck. It'll be so sad for me when you're gone. Oh, well, but you're so clever. You'll get on all right. And you're taking them with you. Now it's Lars, and next it'll be Olaf, one after the other. You're taking them away. You're taking them away. What could Christaver say to this? They disagreed on this point, but in all else Maria was the best of wives and toiled from morning till night, only sometimes with a look of fear in her eyes. Her arms were around his neck now, and she did not quite agree with him again, but it would all come right, for Maria was the best of wives. Toward morning heavy steps were heard going down to the beach, and the lanterns appeared again for now the men were off. It was much earlier than people generally rose, but the wives had wrapped themselves up well in woolen shawls and went down with their husbands. There was a black frost, and the wind was easterly, 
and the falling snow was hard like hail. The sea-fire flashed in blue phosphorus flames beneath the iron heels of the men walking down the beach. The little boats rowed out, and goodbye, and a prosperous voyage were said over and over again. But at the last moment a headman would recollect something for which he must row ashore. Maria was standing with the other wives upon the beach. Beritilla was there too, for it was too dark for anyone to see the bruises on her face. The wind was icy, but they would not go in quite yet, and wrapped their shawls closer and stamped their feet to keep warm. It was just light enough for Maria to see Lash in his seaman's outfit, busying himself with something in the bow of the boat. Then Cristavre climbed back over the roof of the aft cabin to put on the steerage, and then crept forward again and dropped into the headman's place on the seat, turning his face to the land and to her, but without saying anything. Let go! There was a sound of wet rope against an iron ring as the grapnel was hauled in. A block screeched, and the broad, heavy square sail was hoisted up the mast, and, filling with wind, was fastened obliquely across the boat, and the seal moved and began to glide slowly out into the bay. Goodbye, Christaver, goodbye, Lash, and goodbye cried many wives on the beach as they took off the kerchiefs that covered their heads and waved them in farewell. Cristaver was now a headman who swung the tiller above his head and looked after everything on board, but he nevertheless waved his southwester vigorously and shouted, Goodbye! A gust of wind flung dark streaks across the bay. The seal heeled over, and the water foamed at her bow and in her wake, and the red pennon fluttered at the masthead. Maria looked at it, and her face brightened. She had made it out of the material that was to have been a petticoat for herself, and she had embroidered Christavish initials upon it with blue thread. Those who stood on the shore began to turn along the beach, as if trying to keep up with the boats and the last thing that Maria saw as the seal disappeared in the frosty haze was a southwester waved from the stern as the topsail was hoisted. End of chapter 5《Six. So they sailed away. The familiar shore on which their cottages stood disappeared, and in the fresh land wind the boats cut easily through the choppy sea that foamed about their bows. Far up the fjord could be seen other square sails and topsails coming out from the inland districts, and outside new Lofoten boats emerged from bays and inlets and turned out toward the open sea. They were setting out on the familiar voyage northward, those hundreds of miles in wind and cold and blinding snow, the same voyage that their forefathers had made through long past ages. On board the seal, Alessius Hilla and Henry Robben were in the stern with the headman, the one to mind the sheet and the other the bailer in stormy weather, and Canelis Gumon stood forward by the tack, for he had his wits about him in the case of need, and, moreover, was unequalled as a lookout in the dark. The wind howled and whistled as they sped along. There was a sixth man in the forward part of the boat with Lash, and this was the first time he had set foot in a Lofoten boat. He was a pale fellow with a tuft of rusty red beard beneath his chin and gold earrings in his ears, and his name was Arnd Osan. He was from up the valley and had married and moved down to the shore, and now he was going to take to the sea and go out as a Lofoten man. Well, people said to him, if you're going with Christaver, you'll find life a little different from what you're accustomed to. There was a helpless look about him as he now stood in his big sea clothes without an idea as to what he had to do on board a boat. What do you call that? he asked Lash pointing to a line running from one edge of the sail through a block in the bow and back again to the other edge. 
That's the bowline, replied Lash. And that? It was the line from both ends of the yard that the men in the after part held. And that's the brace, said Lash, feeling no little pride in being able to teach a man who was much older than he. And that, said Arndt, pointing now to a triple rope in the middle of the lower edge of the sail, which was made fast to the mast. That's the priyar. Footnote. The rigging of these boats, as also the type of the boats themselves, is similar to that used in the time of the Vikings. End of footnote. Arndt pressed his lips together. He already knew more than he had known before, and he must consider it seriously and thoroughly. The other men stood with legs apart, chewing tobacco and enjoying life. The boat rocked beneath them, and the wind sang in the rigging. They were out of the reach of tradesmen and banks. They were on the sea once more. They were free men. As yet, however, while they were in the fjord, the big Lofoten boat seemed too large. It would be different when the land fell away on both sides, and waves from the ocean itself dashed against her. She would wake up then, as it were, and heel over with the weight of the bulging sail. She pitched slowly up and down, and a wave beat against the bow and sent a shower of water into the forepart of the boat. Both hull and rigging trembled, but the seal went on her way. The men looked at one another, wiped the water from their beards, and laughed. This was real sailing— and they felt a thrill of delight. So what was more natural than that they should look at one another and laugh? "'Do you think there is going to be a storm?' asked Arndt, turning to Cornelis with a face that had become still paler. Cornelis kept a serious countenance when he answered, "'Well, it does look rather bad.' "'Can't you ask Christopher to put in to land?' "'You'd better ask him yourself.' said Cornelis, with the same serious expression. The blue light of a winter day was over land and sea. On the east stood the mountains like an irregular, misty-gray wall, rising into the sky, cleft by ravines and passes, and with here and there streaks of snow and gray clouds drifting over the higher peaks. Bays and fjords ran up into the land, and outstanding promontories were washed by the never-ending billows. Flocks of dark and pied seabirds sat rocking on the waves in the cold wind and screamed in delight over the glorious weather. On the west rolled the grey ocean and tossed its white spray high into the air above an island or a solitary upstanding rock. Two or three blue-white gulls sailed over the seal and cried into the wind, Ow, ow, where are you going? We'll go with you northward, northward. Three of the boats kept in touch with one another, but the fourth, the storm bird belonging to Andrea Ekra, had stolen ahead some time during the night, as was her custom. A few boat lengths to windward was a sea fire with her striped sail, and Peter Shusansa at the helm, at one moment inclined toward the other boats, so that all the yellow oilskins and bearded faces on board were visible, at the next swung over by a wave, and nothing to be seen but sail, white sheer strake and brown bow. A little to leeward was the sea flower, with her tall tanned sail. Jakob with a limp held the tiller. His black hair was covered with a red woolen cap instead of a southwester. When the spray dashed over him, he would take off the cap and beat the water out of it against the side of the boat. He was blessed with such an abundant crop of hair that the cold did not easily penetrate to his skull. He was in the best of tempers today, for he had a home in Lofoten as well as in the south, and in fact was at home in any place to which it was possible to sail. The wind increased, and the sea grew rougher, Gusts of wind beat down from the mountains and made the boats heel over so that they flew along on their side and showed their keel. "'What's the matter forward now?' shouted Christaver, bending down to look under the sail. "'Aunt Olsan wants to go ashore,' answered Lars through the wind. It was Christaver's first real sailing day with the seal, 
and he stood with every sense alert, trying to make acquaintance with the boat. He swung the tiller backward and forward above his head, watched the waves and the rigging, felt with his feet how the boat yielded to a steady wind, to sudden gusts, and to waves. He felt there was something wrong, the boat did not go well, and there was not the right accord between the rigging and the boat. Women and horses have their caprices, and so has the boat, and he meant to tame her. The seal was quick to answer the helm, and with every wave and gust of wind he knew more about the boat than before. He turned his quid between his front teeth and grew more and more alert. He forced the seal up against the light wind and slackened down in a heavy one. He had to learn to know her, and it was like tuning a violin. "'How do you like your new boat?' Jakob shouted to him as the sea flower ran up alongside. Ah, it's too early to say anything about her yet. But the two companion boats began slowly to pass the seal. At first it looked as if they were lying still, one on each side, only riding the waves and foaming at the bow, but by degrees they crept on and on until they were well ahead. Kristavr's face darkened, and he leaned forward as though to drag the seal with him. You must give our best respects to Lofoten, "'shouted Cornelis over to the others. "'Hold your tongue, you idiot!' cried the headman, stamping on the thwart. "'They had still some way to go in open sea, "'and the water was dashing over the waterboard "'so that the men had to bail. "'What's the matter forward now?' cried the headman, "'and Lars's voice answered through the wind. "'Aunt Olson is ill!' "'The sea-fire and the sea-flower were now some way in advance. But Christopher began gradually to gain upon them. He could see, however, that they were sorry for him and would not leave him behind, and that was even worse, and he choked with rage. No greater humiliation could befall a headman. They sailed in among rocks. They had to pass through channels where the trading stations came out into the water on piles. Goodness only knew where the people lived who came there to buy. Then open water again, and on the wind-swept shore of a bay in the grey mountain wall stood a few houses with smoke rising from their chimneys. If mother lived there, thought Lars, she would go quite out of her mind. Poor mother! If only Ulf will do all he can to help her this winter. In through more sounds where the wind was so dead against them that they had to tack. Many boats had collected here and to tack in a channel that was only a few boat lengths in width required incessant going about. Arndt Olson, ill as he was, was put to help with this, but he always seized the wrong rope and was continually getting in the way. "'Go forward, Henry,' cried Christopher. "'Those fellows need a nursemaid.' And Henry Robin ran forward, stopped under the sail, and helped to put it over when they tacked again. Elisus was quite equal to managing the sheet and braces by himself in the stern. The wind went round to the east when the fairway became broader, and Henry had to go aft again and lash forward, for Cornelis had to take the lookout. The daylight was dying, and it was an easy matter to run aground in the channel. Lars now began to understand that the Lofoten sailor is a little more than an ordinary human being. He has eyes and ears such as no other man has, and various other senses. The dusk deepened, and a lighthouse in the west shot up ray upon ray across the water, making the darkness appear all the deeper where the rays did not reach. They saw hardly anything but the white breakers on rocks in front of them and on both sides, but they sailed on safely, Cornelis peering out over the edge of the boat, and making signs with his hand in its white woolen glove, and Christopher at the helm, forcing the seal to fly along with all sail set. The phosphorescence flashed its green light in the foam beneath the bow, and the spray that dashed up from islands and rocks was like green flames in the darkness. To the east the mountains now formed a black wall, and the sea could be heard dashing against it while on the west the voice of the ocean was borne on heavy billows farther and farther out into the night, 
and they sailed on and on, northward, ever northward. Rounding a promontory, they entered a bay where houses stood at the foot of the mountain, with lights in their windows and yellow lanterns gleaming from ships and boats that had anchored in the harbor for the night. The sails were lowered, the grapnel was dropped overboard, and the coffee kettle set over the fire in the cabin. It was close quarters for six men on the bunk, although they had divested themselves of their oilskins, but the bread and butter and the hot coffee were good. They could cook food only when a suitable opportunity presented itself. "'You're the deuce of a fine seaman, aren't?' said Cornelis. And though the little lamp that hung from the roof gave only a feeble light, they could all see that Aunt Olson turned crimson. Lars laughed, Elesus chuckled, and Christaver smiled as he buttered his bread and cut the slice with his sheath knife. Aunt was not happy, and he had wished himself at home long ago. But then Henry Robin turned to him and said, Never mind, Aunt. A master has to start as an apprentice. It was a much-needed encouragement. There was a trading station with a spirit bar on shore, and they could hear already shouts and cries of men who had had too much. Cornelis wanted to go there, but Christaver said no, and borrowing into the straw in the bunk he produced a bottle and poured out the dram for each man, and then said it was time to go to bed. A little boat rowed past them, and they recognized Jakob's voice. He, of course, had to go ashore where there was any prospect of a fight. The men on board the seal drew off their wet sea boots, put out the lamp, and with their clothes on, crept under the skin coverlets, the six men side by side with Lash, as the shortest nearest the stern. It was his first night on the Lofoten voyage, and he was to sleep in a draughty cabin, with the wind and the cold coming in at all the cracks. He wondered whether he had behaved like a real seaman that day. His new woolen gloves had become terribly wet in the course of the day, so now he lay upon them to warm them for the next morning. The weary fishermen were soon snoring to the accompaniment of the wind and the rigging and the deep organ tones of the sea. They may have felt in their sleep that their faces and hands were red and swollen after the long day in the cold and wet, but they slept on rocked by the waves that incessantly beat against the boat. They may perhaps also have felt something that drew them, both mind and body. They had set out. They were going farther, far, far northward, for many miles. On land there were rows between drunken fishermen and the sailors from the large vessels in the harbor, and now and then a little boat meandered over the bay filled with shouting men. End of chapter 6 7. It is possible to sleep and think at the same time. A somnambulist can find his way where a waking man has to stand still. Christopher Miran slept, but while he slept he was working at the seal. It was as if the boat had been sulky all day and refused to go willingly. She had capsized three winters running, and had begun badly today by not keeping up with the others. Christaver slept, but all the time he was trying and trying to find out what was the matter with the boat. In the middle of the night he started up. He was lying nearest the door, and now he swung his feet over the edge of the bunk and crept out. The wind and the snow dashed in his face, but he felt his way to the mast, pushed the sail to one side, and raising the tarpaulin that covered the cargo, stood thinking for a moment. He was not wide enough awake to know quite what he was doing, but he took hold of a barrel of salt and moved it a few yards farther aft, and then did the same with a heavy box and a sack of flour. He then replaced the tarpaulin and returned to the cabin. He was wet with snow and chilled through and through, but he fell asleep, and this time he did not think in his sleep. The weight of the cargo was shifted farther back, and Christopher felt that the boat was happier, and therefore he slept without dreaming. Henry Robin was always the first to get up, for he wanted time to wash himself, to snuff up a little seawater, and to comb his hair and beard. He did not say that others ought to do the same, but he liked to do it himself. 
Long before daylight appeared, all the boats left the harbor and turned northward again. The snow was falling thickly, and they could see only a few boat lengths ahead, but there was a good wind, and on the seal, Cornelius was keeping a lookout. Sail and rigging became heavy with wet snow, and the boat had to be emptied of snow now and again. The beards and the hair of the men grew white, and the men themselves were like snowmen when they stood still for a few minutes. But they sailed on, and rocks and islands flew past them through the falling snow. The sailing began in real earnest only when they again came out into open water and steered northward across Folla, and now the men on the seal began to look at one another. The boat seemed to be in a better humor today. She went more easily over the waves and sped along as if relieved from some burden. When she gradually gained upon the sea-fire and the sea-flower, and then ploughed steadily and surely past them, Cornelis could not help dancing about in the forepart, clapping his hands and singing. The headman stood at the helm, and looked better pleased than he had done the day before, but there was still something about the boat that was not right. He knew it by the yielding in rigging and hull. There was a defect that he must find and correct. Day after day they sailed on, close-hauled in fair wind, or in headwind when they had to tack or simply shelter behind a headland and wait. They went through sounds and out over open sea, and one day it snowed and another it would be clear. It was always cold, and the first thing that Lars and Arndt learned was to stand still hour after hour in the limited space in the boat and feel frozen. The snow beat in their faces and the salt spray dashed upon their backs, their feet grew stiff with cold even when they beat them together every now and then, but in a steady wind there was nothing to do but find their sea legs and put up with the cold. It seemed to Lars that all the men on board began to resemble one another. They stood still and saw the same things and thought about the same things, and their faces were simply a reflection of wind and weather, sky and sea. They grew more like one another every day. It was only the headman who stood alert at the helm from the moment they set off in the morning until they cast anchor again in the evening. If he ate anything in the middle of the day, he took the food in his unoccupied hand and bit the piece off without knowing in the least what it was, while with the other hand he swung the tiller, his eyes darting rapidly from rigging to sea. He stooped down to look forward under the sail. He pushed the tiller quickly out to one side if the boat had suddenly to go about, and his face showed when a gust was coming. He shouted an order, and all the time he munched his crust of bread. The days passed. They were grey days, and the sea was grey, and the naked rocks, and grey too were the clouds that rested on the mountain summits. White gulls hovered in the air above the boats, and a flock of black cormorants rose out of a shadow and flew farther out to sea with hoarse cries. Two or three red houses were congregated in the shelter of an island, and then came miles of sea and rock again. It was a dark land with its brooding gaze turned upon the wintry fog. In the dusk a beacon light flashed out of the mist and the white beams seemed to be seeking for someone to help. A yellow light appeared on shore in an inlet, probably in a little cottage, and then there were miles of darkness before the next light. Those who pass on the sea know that fjords run up into the land, where the mountains are clothed with forest, and farms lie along the shore, and out of these fjords come sail after sail and turn northward with the rest, leaving the grey coast behind them, with more and more banks and tradesmen before whom the fishermen must tremble if they cannot this time find the particular place where the shoals of cod are to be found. One morning when they were going northward past Helgeland, Lars's attention was attracted by a boat that came out from behind a headland and was different from the Lofoten boats he knew. "'Why, look there,' he said, turning to Cornelis. "'Well, have you never seen a boat before?' said Arndt Olsson, unable to see that there was anything remarkable about this one. "'Yes, that's a Nuland boat,' said Cornelis. 
She's good enough in her way, but she can't keep up with us. Lars continued to gaze at her. She was smaller than a stout's boat and had no topsail, and the headman did not stand to steer, but sat comfortably on the seat. But the whole boat was pretty, and her lines were graceful, and she darted along as if at any moment she might rise into the air and fly like a seabird. She was a Nulan ten-oared boat, and her crew, in yellow southwesters and oilskins, spoke a softer, more sing-song dialect. The number of Nulan boats increased, and the fairway seemed crowded with sails. Here a sloop raised her grey square sail above the others, there a black-hulled Galeas ploughed her way through the throng, or a solitary steamer vomited its smoke into the air all on their voyage northward through snow and storm. For three days they lay weather-bound in Buda, and during this time the crew of the seal were all on shore except Aunt Olsen, who was so exhausted with all he had gone through lately that he felt he would have to rest if he was ever to be himself again. And there he lay, and trembled whenever he heard the shouts of the drunken seamen in the town. Late in the evening, Elesus Hilla crept in, smelling of spirits, and began to tell him about Jakob. <laughs> he he was really killing this time. Not really, man. But Elesus told him that it was in a tavern, and he himself was glad he had got away before the police came. They were some Bergen men with whom Jakob, damn it all with a limp, had had a disagreement. Elesus then lay down and went to sleep, and one by one the others came on board. Christophe handled Cornelia somewhat roughly, for he opened the cabin door and threw him into the bunk head first. Henry Robin was the last to come, and it was late when he came down to the harbour, and he walked slowly, for he was carrying Jakob on his back. It was still pitch dark the next morning when Christophe roused the other men. The weather was still stormy, but he meant to set out, for he was tired of lying there, waiting. While they were swallowing a little coffee, Elesus told them about Jakob, but Christophe remarked that he had been killed so many times before that no one could stay on longer on that account. Henry Robin said nothing. Large steamers and sailing vessels lay with their lanterns pitching when the seal, with three reefs in her sail, set out in the dark. The men on board knew it was a mad thing to do, since not even the steamers dared venture out, but no one cared to offer any advice to Christophe on the sea. The harbour light was soon lost in the driving snow. The seal rode upon huge, foaming billows, among islands and rocks round which the spray dashed high into the air. The men had to tie on their southwesters to keep them from blowing away, and the noise of the sea, the breakers, and the wind was deafening. In the forepart of the boat, the men had to keep on bailing under a perpetual shower of water as the waves broke in over the bow. Everyone bailed except the man at the helm, who, with face dripping with seawater, took note of nothing but the wind, the rigging, and the waves. Late in the day, when the snow fell less thickly, they rode on the storm wave into the harbour on the island of Grøtøy. This is the last station before Lofoten, and there is only the west fjord to cross, but that is no small matter either. A number of people were standing on the shore, gazing at this stormy petrel that was coming in from the sea alone. The men on board looked like ghosts, with their white hair, white beards, and white eyebrows, and among the men's faces was a boy's face, with the water, either tears or sea water, running down it. It was here that Aunt Osan, in the hearing of all his fellow seamen, asked to be allowed to go home again in a steamer. No one answered him, not even Henry Robin. They were in the cabin, sawing themselves with coffee and a bite of food, when they heard shouts from another boat that was coming into the harbour. Lars put out his head, and as he drew it in again, said, It's actually Andreas Ekra. At this his father laughed, and bringing out the bottle, poured out the dram. Ha ha, he said with a chuckle. That rascal wasn't first this time. Sometime later shouts were heard from another boat, 
and this time Eleazar's put his head out at the cabin door, but quickly drew it in again. "'No, confound it,' he said. "'I've seen a ghost.' "'What's the matter?' "'Jakob, and he was dead yesterday. "'As true as I stand here, he has just come sailing in with a sea-flower.' "'I knew he would,' said Christopher. "'Jakob may let you think he is killed, but he doesn't mean anything by it.' It had been quickly rumoured in Bude that the boat had gone out in the storm, and this had vexed Andreas Ekra, whose custom it was to steal out in advance. He lost no time in setting out, and then Jakob had to follow him. And when the steamers learned that some open boats had found the weather good enough to sail in, they were obliged, for very shame, to hoot their way out. It was an old custom for the Namdal crews to wait on Grøttøy for the Stadslanders to come and thrash them. They themselves said it was the other way around, but that was not true. A great many Namdal boats were now lying there, getting up their courage to cross the West Fjord. These boats, like their owners, were a motley company. There were Lister boats, sloops, Nulan boats, and ten-oared boats of the Ofjord type, and the men themselves were fair or dark, but most of them little swarthy fellows, with sea-boots only to their knees, and trousers of blue sailcloth, with black patches behind. They looked as if they were made up of cheap shop material, and they were a mixture of a fisherman and what a true Lofoten voyager despises more than anything else, a sailor. It was not until the next day that the customary fighting began. It was up at the tradesmen, where both the shop and the bar were full of stads men. They became, perhaps, rather noisy toward evening, and perhaps sang a song or two. At any rate, the barmaid refused to supply them with more drink, and the fat shopkeeper came in himself in his flowery clothes and tried to turn them out. If he had not had a Namdal man with him, who began to be important and reprove them, the stads men would have gone away quietly, but as it was... They took the little man with the intention of throwing him out at the door, but, unfortunately, made a mistake and sent him through the window. The man lay moaning in the snow, with bits of glass in his hair and beard, and calling on his countrymen to help. Meanwhile the stadsmen had become inclined for more drink, so they pushed the shopkeeper out at the door and locked the barmaid into a cupboard, and then busied themselves with opening bottles and turning on taps in such a way that everyone should benefit by it. Just as they had settled down quietly, however, with happy faces to enjoy themselves, Namdal men thronged in from all the doors, back and front. Things became livelier and livelier, not with drink, but with fists and brass tobacco boxes as weapons. Tables, chairs, bottles, and glasses flew about, adding to the noise of heavy boots, shrieks, cries, and falls on the floor or through doors and windows. The barmaid in the cupboard shrieked that they must let her out, and the shopkeeper stood outside with the bailiff trying to get in, but in the meantime there was no room for them. The little Namdal men were supple and slipped close up to the big, heavy Trondjem men, seizing them wherever it hurt most, and even flying at their throats and biting them. And this they called fighting. The Stads men were slower, but when they hit a the man he fell to the floor. Even Jakob was limping about, swinging his tobacco box, though he stood for the most part in the doorway, and bestowed a parting kick upon every Namdal man who was thrown down the steps. The end was as might have been expected. The room was cleared of Namdal men, after which the others had an extra drink, paid for what they had had, and sauntered down to the boats again. Jakob was the only one left, for it was always his custom to treat the bailiff. All the evening and far into the night, the Namdal men in the harbour were shouting and bleating like goats over the stad's boats, for they knew that nothing could make them more angry than to call their big fine boats goaty boats. Grötte is a boundary stone on the voyage north. Up to it the boats have kept along the coast all the time and have been within sight of land, but tomorrow they will set out across the west fjord, over eighty-five miles of sea. Visions haunt the fisherman's mind the night before he starts, 
and his sleep is not as sound as usual. There are many sayings and stories about the West Fjord. There is the fog that surrounds the boats some miles from land, while at the same time a storm rises and they drift westward, right up to the celebrated Maelstrom, where they are whirled around as in a funnel and disappear into the depths. Much is fable, but it haunts the sleepers' minds, and there is at any rate one thing that everybody knows, and that is that on the stormy waters of the West Fjord many a boat has turned keel upward and the fishermen clinging to it have never been seen again. End of chapter 7《8. That night in Grøttøy, Elesius Hylla could not sleep. He was ready enough to take part in any fun, and he had helped to thrash the Namdal men but he was one of those who preferred to let others stand treat and always made his escape in good time, and now he lay thinking about his last Sunday at home. They were to have taken the sacrament together, he and bared it, but instead of that it came about that he beat her, and in church the priest had said in his sermon that we must all one day stand in the presence of God. Suppose it were to-morrow that he had to stand there, they were to set out across the West Fjord tomorrow. He was no coward, and at sea he was as good as anyone, and yet he now lay sighing. O oh God, he prayed, O oh God, forgive me all the evil I've done. O oh God, O oh God. That same evening Cornelis Gumon went inland alone, until he came to a large farm where a light was burning in an upper window. She was sitting there, perhaps, and perhaps with a baby. It was two years ago, when they had lain here weather-bound, that he had met her. It was wicked of him to pretend that he was the son of a rich man and could take her home to a large farm if she would have him. Since then she had written that she was going to have a child, and then again after that and he had never answered any of her letters. He now wandered round the house in the darkness. A dog began to bark, but Cornelis kept at a good distance. Perhaps she was sitting in that room, he thought, and was probably as pretty as she had been in those days, and here he was wandering about in the darkness and could do nothing. At last he turned and took the road to the shore once more, but stopped to look back at the light in the window. Then he set off at a run as if to escape from it all, but afterwards slackened his pace a little, swinging his body from side to side, and singing as he went. The next morning they set out in a northerly gale through snow that stung like hail, and over long rolling billows. Lars stood in the bow with the other two, bailing incessantly as the waves foamed high above them and broke into the boat. When he glanced up for a moment there was no land to be seen. The sky was fog, and the sea was green rolling mountains with crests of foam. The sea seemed so vast, and the boat so tiny. They went down head first into the trough of a wave, and it grew dark about them. They climbed up another mountain, and it grew lighter and lighter. Then they rode for a little while upon the back of the wave, which carried them on a little, but once more dived down into another valley, with a chill of suspense. Would they ever come up again? In the midst of all this, Arndt Olson lost his wits, and, falling on his knees and raising his wool-gloved hands above his head, cried out again and again, Lord, save us! We perish, until a voice thundered from the stern. Pitch him overboard. Lars was afraid, but it helped him just to look at his father. He had never known what his father was like until today. The boat seemed to wail and groan under the pressure that the headman put upon her. He seemed to be standing there with clenched teeth, determined to make her yield even at the risk of his life. He had a wife and children, and there were such things as banks and tradesmen, but today he thought of nothing but his boat, today he rode upon clouds and wind. 
A gigantic billow comes out of the sky, capable of dashing them down to certain death. But Christaver sees at once what angle he will cut it off, and he pulls in the sheet to give the boat power for a good start, and they mount up and up the giant wave, are carried along by it, and then once more plunge downward. Will they manage it? The black line of a squall comes racing over the foaming wave crests, but Christaver can feel how much his boat can bear, and he runs her into the teeth of the wind and shouts, Slack the sheet! Slack the sheet! Alessius repeats and lets it out, so that the sail is relaxed and only half the wind can act upon it. While they plunged along, Christaver also kept an eye on his companion boats, for on such a day something might happen and there might be need for help. Through the storm he could see the sea-fire with her striped sail, which looked no bigger than a gnat's wing on the sea, and farther west the sea-flower was plunging along with her tanned sail at one moment standing high against the sky, at the next disappearing in the trough of a wave, and then, after what seemed a long time, coming once more into view. There were hundreds of boats on the west fjord, but the sea is great, and they could hardly see one another. The wind increased, and Lars had to go to the mast to mine the priar, so that only Cornelis was left to do the bailing of the bow, for Arndt stood holding on to the thwart, looking more dead than alive and trembling all over. Suddenly, without any warning, the wind fell, and it became calm in the middle of the west fjord but a little later it grew darker in the west with another wind, a west wind. The sail was reset, and for a time they ran on in a choppy sea, because the wind and the waves beat against one another. The fog lifted, the sky cleared, and it became intensely cold. The men were wet through with the waves and with perspiration from the hard bailing, and when they now had to stand still in the cold, the sea-water turned to ice on their clothes, and the perspiration froze upon their bare bodies. Their teeth chattered, and they danced up and down and swung their arms, half mad with the icy cold in their joints and limbs. The seal sailed on, and the headman brought out his compass. The dusk was beginning to fall, when suddenly his face brightened, and he bit off a quid. There was a yellowish evening light upon the sea from the long, fiery beams in the sky, far down in the southwest. But what was that right ahead? Lars gazed and forgot that he was cold. He saw between sea and sky a long layer of dark blue cloud, and above it other clouds that were white, and in the golden light from the evening sky it all looked like a fairyland of blue and white and gold. Look there, he said to Cornelis. Yes, that's Lofoten, said Cornelis. What nonsense! It's a bank of cloud, isn't it? No, it's mountain right enough. It's the Lofoten wall, answered Cornelis, jumping up and down and beating his arms upon his chest. There will be a dram for us this evening. Lars went on gazing as they drew nearer and nearer. This was Lofoten, about which he had heard ever since he was a tiny boy, a land in the Arctic Ocean that all boys along the coast dreamed of visiting some day, a land where exploits were performed, fortunes were made, and where fishermen sailed in a race with death. Through hundreds of years they had migrated thither, and many of them had lost their lives on the sea. A few returned home with well-filled pockets, but the greater number sailed to the end of life in poverty. Yet they went up again and again, year after year, generation after generation. It was their fairyland of fortune. They had to go. And now the turn had come to Lars. Now he was to see Lofoten. The banks of cloud between sky and ocean turned into solid mountains, a long chain of blue mountains running southwest, streaked with snow and with snowdrifts on their summits. They were like an army of stone giants that had crossed the sea and had stopped here to consider. Yellow beacon lights were already visible, flashing out between sea and mountain, 
and there was the distant sound of the waves breaking upon the cliffs and islands of the rocky shore. It was as if the ocean sang. The boats on the west fjord now steered by the beacons toward the various fishing stations at which they were to live during the fishing season that winter. Late in the evening the seal worked her way up through a sound with red and green beacon lanterns on either side. Within, at the foot of a perpendicular mountain wall, lay the station, with innumerable lights shining from houses and wharves on land, and from cabins and masts in the harbour, and reflected in wavy streaks in the black water of the bay and the sound, from which there rose a penetrating odour of fish oil, pitch and fish. The seal dropped her grapnel, to wait until the inspector had assigned her her place, and there she lay among the streaks of light, grey with all the spray that had frozen upon her as she crossed the west fjord. The men tramped ashore, their joints stiff and their clothes crackling as the ice on them broke as they walked. They made for a low yellow-painted little house, which stood among hundreds of others of the same description, and had a turf roof. It was the hut that they were to share with the crew of the sea-fire this winter. Kristavet, however, made his way straight to the telegraph station, where he managed to scrawl with a swollen hand the telegram which he always sent, with the same wording every year, and which wives and children were waiting for in a few grey cottages far away in the south. Arrived safely, all well, Kristavet. This done, he straightened himself and took a deep breath. He had stood at the helm all day from early morning, and such a day on the west fjord takes it out of one. When the men arrived at the hut, they found the door blocked by a great snowdrift, and while the others set out to kick it away, Cornelis went to fetch the key from the station king at the shop. When at last they were able to open the door, the snow fell on the floor before them. The room was empty for it was here that the sacks of flour, barrels, boxes of provisions, and nets were to be stacked when the time came. In the inner room the first thing they saw when a match was struck was snow that had sifted in over the floor and into the bunks along the wall. A little window that looked upon the sound was covered outside with sea spray and inside with cobwebs, and the rest of the floor was black, and there was an odor of fish, skin rugs and damp mould. This room was to be the home of the two boats' crews, twelve men in all, for the winter. It was as cold as a boathouse. End of chapter 8 9. The Kelpie must have forgotten to tidy up the place before we came, said Cornelis. A lamp with a few drops of oil in it was hanging over the table. They lighted it, and, finding some sticks, made a fire in the rusty stove, upon which stood a black coffee kettle containing brown grounds from the year before. There was also a little kitchen, and there, half buried in the snow upon the hearth, stood a black pot with the remains of soup that they had forgotten to empty away before they left for home the previous spring. Now, Henry, you must get your apron on, said the lasers. Henry Robin was the one who used to attend to the comfort and cleanliness of the house, and while the others began carrying up provisions and bedding from the boat, he fetched water, washed out the kettle and the pot, and swept up the snow from the floor and out of the bunks. When the men finally came in, the ice in their hair and beard soon began to melt in the heat of the stove, and they threw off their oilskins and tried to thaw their frozen boots at the fire, though it was some time before they were pliable enough to be pulled off. Out in the kitchen the wood was already crackling under a large pan full of water, and the kettle was puffing the fragrant odor of coffee into the room. "'I suppose we'll be having something hot for supper tonight, shan't we?' asked Henry making his appearance at the kitchen door, still with his sea-boots on. You'll have to go out, Elesus, after fresh fish. I dare say that can be managed, said Elesus with a laugh. 
He was already in his wooden shoes and he clattered out of the house. Eleseus was on friendly terms with everyone on the station, and it was not long before he returned with three large cod in one hand and a scoopful of liver in the other. He said he had borrowed it of a fisherman who lived on the station. "'Upon my word, we're going to have a good supper,' said Christaver, who came in immediately afterward. Dram glasses went round, and they looked at one another and wished one another welcome to Lofoten. Even Arndt Osan was treated as one of themselves. The hot coffee did them good, but now, after the bitter cold out on the sea, their fingers and toes began to tingle painfully in the warmth of the room. They clapped their hands and shook their fingers and danced about the floor in their shoes, but at last there was nothing for it but to take off their stockings and go outside and bury their hands and feet in the snow for a little while. Just as the potatoes were ready, and the fish and liver lay smoking on the dish, a tramping of feet was heard outside, and the crew of the sea-fire, with Peter Susansa at their head, came into the room. The cold of the sea seemed to envelop them, and their clothing, beards, and hair were grey with ice. The room became icy cold, as if every man had brought in a winter's day with him. "'That's good!' exclaimed Peter Sansa. I see you've got supper ready. He began to divest himself of his oilskins. Christaver at once poured out a dram for every man and bade them welcome to Lofoten, they bidding him welcome in return. The newcomers had soon brought up their things from the boat and tugged off their boots, and then they gathered around the table for the first time that year, all the twelve who were to live together as one family during the winter. The stove grew hotter, and faces and hands began to swell and smart after the frost and fog on the sea, but they had lived for ten days upon raw salt pork, coffee and bread, and the cooked food, fresh fish, liver, and hot potatoes tasted delicious. They ate as if they could never be satisfied, as if they always had room for more, and when there was nothing left but fish bones and potato skins, they sat looking at one another's red, swollen faces, as if with the consciousness of good work well done. And then it would not have been Peter Susansa if he had not brought out a bottle and poured out a dram all round. On his way from the telegraph station, Christopher had gone into the shop, which was, as usual, crowded with fishermen, to hear the news. The fishing did not promise badly this year. Some men had taken two and three hundred cod in one set of nets, and Kaplan had been found in the stomachs of some. It was the first indication of how things might be this winter, and they looked at it and talked it over, but they had a difficulty in keeping their eyes open in the heat. It was as much as they could do to put fresh straw into the bunks and fling in the bedclothes. At last they could take off their trousers and coat when they went to bed. The lamp was blown out, and for a little while they lay chatting and yawning. The stove was hot, and the wet clothes and boots that were hung around it to dry sent out a pungent odor of seawater, perspiration, and damp leather. The bunks were damp and the skin coverlets cold, but the men fell asleep with the feeling that they had come to their own again and in a way were at home. The fire died down and the room grew cold. The chill Nordland night penetrated everywhere and the clothes and boots around the stove, which had been dripping with water, began once more to grow white and stiff and the breath of the sleepers came from their lips like little grey clouds. Lars dreamed of his mother. He had somehow or other got out upon the sea in a wheelbarrow, and it was gradually sinking beneath him. His mother was standing on the shore, and she threw a rope to him and cried, Lars, don't you see I want to save you? Then his father called him from a boat farther out and threw a line out to him, and Lars took it and let himself be pulled out to his father. But his mother cried more and more distressfully, Lars, Lars, 
Don't you care for your mother any more? In the middle of the night he woke with a cold and found himself lying beside his father. End of chapter 9、10. The fishing station covered several islands that lay close in under the precipitous mountainside, and as there were no bridges over the sounds between them, there was a constant passing backward and forward of small boats. Scattered over these islands were several hundred little fishermen's huts with roofs of turf, and above them rose the church, the hospital, the fisherman's home, and the station king's white house and long yellow warehouse. In the sounds and on the bay rocked a forest of masts belonging to steamers, sailing vessels, and boats large and small. There were more than thirty such fishing stations upon the Lofoten Islands, and at this time of the year they were all busy little towns. There were fishermen from even farther north than south, and altogether they peopled a stretch of coast some fifteen hundred miles in length. The men had to have a day or two in which to settle down, and they carried many a heavy burden on their shoulders up from the boat into the outer room in the hut. The after cabin had to come off and the high rigging to come down, for these were used only on the voyage north and south, the lower rigging alone being employed as long as the fishing went on. When all this was accomplished, The men had a little breathing space in which to look at the wind and weather, chat with the men from Nuland, and drink a dram with old acquaintances. Kristaver stood on the edge of the wharf, looking at the seal, which, after her re-rigging, was lying among a number of other boats. They lay side by side along the sound, as if resting after their long voyage, some with a green line around the sheer streak, others with a white line. while a few had the brown tar color all over. Each of them could have told a tale of the fishing banks and the voyages in storm and fog. One had sailed home with wealth, another had capsized, and her crew had been washed from her keel into the waves one night, and yet there she now lay, looking perfectly innocent. Beside a stout lander, The Nuland boat looked slim and light, with her backward curving prow, as though throwing back her head before dashing through wind and wave. The Stad's boat was heavier in her lines and bigger, and, as she lay there, seemed to say to the Nuland boat, If you're ever out in a storm, you may thank the Lord if I'm anywhere in the neighborhood. It was the seal, however, that Kristavit was looking at. His feeling for the boat was like that of a man toward his horse, and he almost expected it would know him and whinny to him. Well, he said to himself, we've got here all right, but it looked dangerous. She's still a little willful, and I must try to cure her of that. Turning, he walked in his light land boots in among the rows of houses. The odor of the fishing station made his nostrils quiver, and always gave him a feeling of youth and raised many expectations. Suppose it were to be a good fishing season this winter. Fishermen swarmed everywhere, from honest farmer fishermen in homespun to wandering sailors who seemed made up of sea boots, sailcloth, and beard. Outside one or two huts, fish were already hung up to dry. A door opened, and a hairy fellow emptied a cooking pot into the road. Heads, bones, and intestines of fish lay scattered everywhere, and high above the roofs of the houses, grey and white gulls hovered screaming. Through it all sounded the heavy booming of the sea. Kristaver greeted an acquaintance here and there, but did not stop. He was the kind of man that people turned to look at after he has passed. The stalwart man in homespun had an easy gait, and there was not a grey hair in his short red beard or on his fair curly head. He would still occasionally join in a dance of an evening, and though he might frighten people out of their wits on the sea, he was all sunshine on land, and no one could laugh more heartily over a dram and a good story than Kristaver. This year he had his boy with him, however, and if he knew him aright, 
Lars had two eyes that would take note of everything that his father did. But he could never quite get hold of Lars. The boy seemed to go round him, measuring and weighing him, and considering whether he was the kind of man that he himself would care to follow. Well, well, he had more book-learning and a good head, but if his mother got her way and made him part company with his father and leave the whole business, then, well, then things would not be quite what he had expected when he ventured into all this with a seal. Hello, it surely isn't you. It was me yesterday, but is it really you? Kristavar had run right into Edwin Hansen, a friend from Varanger in the north, and the man stood laughing all over his red beardless face. Kristavar held out his hand and laughed too. The two had met here every winter for thirty years. Kristavar had saved the other one stormy night when he was clinging to the keel of his capsized boat, and once Edwin had drawn his knife and saved Kristavar from being killed by drunken sailors in a riot. Since then they had been so much together when on shore that people began to nickname them lovers. "'Are you all right?' "'I'm just as right as can be,' said the Newlander. "'But, by the by, the commander is expected here.' "'No. Are we going to have a visitation already?' "'Yes, confound it. You'll have to know your lesson now, Christavid.' The commander was the chief inspector, and if Providence was ever in Lofoten at all, it must have been in this man's form. It was no trifling matter when he steamed into a fishing station, his vessel flying the government flag. People knew that he had been in wars abroad and went about with bullets in his body. He was also aide-de-camp to the king at the palace, and scolded and raged at high and low, Caps flew off wherever he appeared. Edwin Hansen took Christavre into a bar, where they sat talking over a cup of coffee, telling each the other about his home. The Newlander had heard so often about Maria and Tosten and Olaf that he asked about them as if he had known them intimately, and Christavre asked about the other's wife and children and knew them just as well, although they were many miles off. Yes, he had lost two brothers since they last met. One of them had died in his bed, and the other was drowned in the Varanger fjord in the autumn. Oh, you don't mean it, exclaimed Christavr, gazing at him. Yes, it was unfortunately true, but one of the widows owned half of the implements and the boat that he was headman in, and received a third of what was taken by them, so that she was quite well off, he was very glad to say. And what about the other? The other? Well, she had nothing whatever to live upon, not so much as a cottage on an island, so he had brought her and her four children home to his own cottage before he left. Why, but you've got a wife and six children yourself, and only a cottage on an island. Right you are, that's just what it is. And as to room, why, some of the children have to sleep under the kitchen dresser, but except from that, it's all plain sailing. A brother is a strange thing, and it's worse for the one that's dead to keep the widow and the children than for the one that's living. Well, that's how it is. You've got to keep going and trust to the fishing and luck. But I've heard you've got your son with you this year. When Christavr was once more hurrying along between the rows of houses, he was stopped by Peter Susansa. Have you heard the news? he said. Jakob declares that he is going to stand in the street this evening and offer the commander a dram. Oh, that'll be a sight. I wouldn't mind taking a ticket to see it. It'll be at seven o'clock. The commander is going to a party at the station king's then, and Jakob is going to stand there and wait for him. Kristavr laughed heartily, and as he hurried on he could see in the faces of all he met that it was this news about Jacob that was sending them hither and thither. Even the Jew Moses was trotting about with his curly black hair under a fur cap, and his hands buried deeply in the pockets of his brown coat, exclaiming, Have you heard the news? Wonderful news! Zat Jacob! Ach Gott! Haben Sie heard it? 
There was a crowd of fishermen in the shop at the station kings, chewing tobacco and spitting and exchanging news, but they were not making any purchases, for they had not yet earned any money. Moreover, there was a silent war going on between the fishermen and the man behind the counter. The shop assistant in his high boots and shining leather coat stood with a yard measure in his hand, looking out of the window, but there was nothing to do. The shopkeeper himself came in now and then from the office and pretended to look for something on one of the shelves, but the shop full of fishermen might have been empty air for all the notice he took of them. He was a stout, grey-haired man, with a florid, wrinkled face and yellowish eyes, which he screwed up when he looked at anything. The day was past when hats and southwesters were removed from their owner's heads the moment he made his appearance. He had once been king in more than name, and that was when no fisherman dared to sell what he had caught to any other than him, and when he fixed the prices and owned all the huts and could demand whatever rents he chose. One day, however, the government authorities stepped in, with the result that the fishermen lost all their respect and dropped all that could be called politeness, sold their fish to the trading vessels and wanted credit at the shop. There they stood now, with flashing eyes that seemed to say, We aren't afraid of you any longer. For hundreds of years men like you have oppressed us fishermen, here and all over Lofoten, but now we snap our fingers in your face and tell you to be off. The old man did not see them, but went back into his office. Lars and Cornelis Gumon were out together, wandering about the islands, both in blue caps and homespun clothes. They were about the same height. Cornelis was twelve years the senior, but if it had not been for his fair moustache, his face would have looked quite as youthful as that of his companion. He was going to show the boy all the sights of the station, and as they hurried along, Lars tried to imitate the other's manner of rocking from side to side as he walked, wearing his cap on one side and looking the deuce of a fine fellow. "'Have you thought when you're going to stand treat?' asked Cornelis. "'No, what's that?' asked Lars. "'Ha, ha! He doesn't know what standing treat is. Do you know what a scory is?' "'No. Is it a bird or a fish?' "'Well, in the first place it's a one-year-old gull, a gull like that one over the sound there. But besides that, it's a lad that's come to the Lufoten fishing for the first time.' "'Oh, then I'm a scory.' Of course you are, but a scory has to treat all the men in his hut. To treat? Is that to give them a thrashing? Lash was trying to acquire a taste for chewing tobacco, and was spitting a brown juice in every direction. <laughs> Laughed Cornelis, measuring him with his eye from top to toe. No, no, my friend, it is to stand the drinks. A quart of spirits to every man is the least you can do. Oh, dear! That's tremendous. But there is no spirits to be bought at the station. Cornelis laughed. <laughs> you come with me one evening on board a trading vessel, and you'll see you can get as many hundred quarts as you'd like. They visited a few bars, and Lars could see on what good terms Cornelis was with all the girls. Afterward, when he went about the island, people soon let him know what he himself was. He was a scory, they said, and he would have to stand drinks. But where in the world was he to get all the money for such a quantity of spirits? Arndt Olsen was sitting alone in the hut, with his elbows on the table and his chin resting on his hands. He was alone, yes. The others were out enjoying themselves in the Lufoten atmosphere, and even the boy Lars knew about everything both on board and on shore— because he had grown up among accounts and tales of fishing life. But he himself, who in his valley at home was considered to be a fine fellow, had up to the present only been the laughing stock of the whole crew on board the boat. He could learn the way to do things on board and their names, but as to being a seaman. Whenever he opened his lips to say a word about wind and weather, the others winked at one another and smiled and he had to stand this for a whole winter. Ah, oh, if he were only at home again! 
he would sit down and scribble a letter to Gudina. He had never longed so much to take her on his knee and talk to her as he did now, but there were hundreds of miles between them. The door opened, and Henry Robin came in, closing it after him. For a moment he stood looking at Arndt with a little smile. His eyes were large and serious, and his hair and beard well combed. "'You look as if you were down in the dumps,' he said. "'Well, it is no concern of yours if I am,' said Arndt, crossly. "'No, no, but come out with me for a turn. I must show you the sights of the station, and perhaps we can get a cup of coffee and a dram. Come on.' Arndt pulled the rusty beard beneath his chin doubtfully, but then rose, and they went out together. A shooting gallery had been set up on one of the wharfs, and the place was crowded with seamen bent on having a shot. "'Fancy throwing away your money on that,' said Arndt. But Henry thought it was amusing to watch, and he would even like to have a shot himself, only it didn't happen to be convenient just today. They went into a tavern and ordered coffee, and some drunken sailors sitting there began to fight. Arndt was about to interfere and turn them out, but Henry kept him back. Let them fight it out, he said, adding that he would not mind being in a good fight himself, only as it happened there was no chance of it just today. Arndt stared at him in surprise. He could never make that fellow out. Toward evening the commander's vessel, flying the government flag, entered the bay, with the commander in uniform on board. Two sub-inspectors rowed quickly out, raising their hands to their caps when still at some distance, and in somewhat of a tremor at the prospect of coming face to face with the all-powerful one. He stepped down into their boat and let them row him in over the bay, while his eagle eye glanced around from vessel to vessel. And why the deuce is that oil steamer lying there? He suddenly thundered. There was no other place for her, sir, one of the sub-inspectors ventured to say. Place be damned, returned the commander. She's lying right in the way of all the traffic both out and in. Get her out of the road and lose no time about it. They rode in through the sounds, the commander standing up and looking at the two long rows of fishing boats lying along both wharfs side by side, like horses in a stable. This was right, but that he never said. When a thing was as it should be, he only cleared his throat and said nothing. It was a clear, frosty evening, with the first appearance of a thin moon in the eastern sky. The snow creaked under many feet and round the huts in the neighborhood of the station king's house the roads were black with people, with much excited whispering and subdued chuckling. The commander would soon be coming, and what would he do with Jakob? Henry Robin and Arndt Olson had taken up a good position from which they could see the door of the station king's house. Uneven, creaking steps were heard in the snow, and Jakob appeared, with a bottle protruding from his pocket. He had shaved his upper lip, and it was quite blue. Ho, ho, he said with a grin. When Jacob was in extra good spirits, he always said ho, ho. You daren't do it, said a man in the crowd, in a low voice. Oh, dear, no, I daren't do it. Oh, dear, no, replied Jacob, as he limped on between two black walls of people. Suddenly a stillness fell upon the crowd. "'Here he comes,' said a voice, and a shiver seemed to pass through them. The creaking of a quick, firm step was heard. It was the commander. He faced the moon as he came, and it shone upon a sturdy, erect figure, with a clear-cut, clean-shaven face and keen eyes. His cap was a little on one side, and over his double-breasted coat he wore a fur collar. The sight of the crowds awaiting people on both sides made him hesitate, and many of them were in such suspense as to what was going to happen that they forgot to remove their southwesters. The commander slackened his pace and glanced from side to side. At last he halted, and in a voice of thunder said, "'What's going on here?' Upon this the creaking of uneven steps was heard, 
and Jacob emerged from the crowd and advanced toward the commander, who was standing between the two rows of people, with his shadow behind him on the snow. "'Beg pardon,' said Jacob, taking off his southwester. "'It was only—' "'Oh, it's you, is it? Are you here again this winter? Have you come to promise that you'll behave properly, so that we shan't have any rows?' It was only to ask if you would. If there is anything you want, man, you know where the inspector's office is. Go home and behave properly. The commander began to move on. Now, however, Jacob simply stepped in front of him and stood with his southwester in his hand, broad and crooked, with a smile upon his face. To think of boxing the ears of a man with such a face was an impossibility. It was only to ask if we might welcome you, sir. We've heard that you're thinking of resigning, sir, and if you do, all Lofoten will be sorry. That was all, sir, and we're here to ask if you'll let us give you a cheer, and then we want to ask you, sir, to do us the honor to drink a dram with us. It's Lysholm Akavitae. And before the commander had recovered from his astonishment, Jakob had drawn the bottle from his pocket, removed the cork, and after wiping its mouth with the palm of his hand, handed the bottle to the amazed officer. At this juncture, Eleseus Hilla, who was standing exactly opposite the White House, but had taken care to have at his back a door through which he could escape, if the necessity arose, prepared to take flight, but wanted to see what took place up to the last possible minute. The commander had not yet taken the bottle, but he cleared his throat. "'That's you all over,' he said at last, suddenly taking the bottle. But before putting it to his mouth, he said in a loud voice that all could hear, "'You're celebrating my funeral too early, children. I've no intention of resigning, and I hope to go on abusing you for many years to come. Your health!' And he raised the bottle to his lips, threw back his head, and drank so that the liquid gurgled. "'A cheer for the commander!' cried Jacob who could now hardly keep his feet in his wild enthusiasm. The cheers resounded on all sides as the commander returned the bottle, waved his hand deprecatingly, and actually ran. "'Of oh, that Jakob,' said Aunt Orson, "'what's the good of such fool's play?' Henry, however, thought it was splendid, and only wished he was man enough to do the same sort of thing himself. "'We must have a dram after that.' he added. Finally he succeeded in getting Arndt to go with him to a war for dancing was going on. It gives zest to the dancing when there is only one girl to every hundred men. And Arndt was thinking only of Gurina. Henry followed the couple with his eyes and looked as if he would like to dance too, but just this evening nothing came of it. End of chapter 10《Eleven. At last the first seagoing day had arrived, and long before it was light the fishing fleet lay crowded together at the entrance into the open sea, waiting for the signal flag to be hoisted on the inspection office. Oars struck against one another and creaked. One boat bumped up against another, and at the same time was pushed from the opposite side, and oaths and abusive epithets filled the air. Each one wanted to be first. Then the flag ran up, and crowded as the water had been before, the hubbub that ensued only seemed to make matters worse. Oars were broken, there were shouts and cries on all sides, and here and there a boat hook was raised as a weapon. "'Will you keep off you? Oh, hold your jaw!' A fresh breeze was blowing up the west fjord from the south, and the fleet now sailed out, rocking upon the long, heavy swell. On the horizon in the southwest, Lars saw something he had never seen before. A mountainous island lay there alone, far out at sea, and now it had risen above the water and was floating in the air like a gigantic bird. He gazed in wonder, for, incredible though it was, he really saw a line of yellow sky between the island and the sea. "'What in the world's that?' he exclaimed, pointing to it. That's Vare, answered Cornelis, and if you are wondering at the island taking a trip up into the air, I can tell you that it's looming. 
Looming? repeated Aunt Osan, who was also staring, while he chewed a quid. That's what it's called, yes, and you'll see plenty of that sort of thing here in Lofoten before you've done with it. White and tanned sails were scattered all over the surface of the sea. They were making for the same banks to which the forefathers of these fishermen had sailed for many hundreds of years, and the grounds extended for mile after mile along the Lofoten Wall, and attracted fleets of boats from every fishing station, right out to the Maelstrom, far away to the west. They had marks on the Lofoten Mountains and marks in the north, by which they could take their bearings and know where the nets should go out, and when at last they reached this point and backed sail, the thin frost haze had cleared, and the whole wide surface of the west fjord lay before them. Far, far away on the east could be seen the mountains on the mainland, looking like a white, wavy line between sky and ocean. Cornelis Gumun glanced in that direction for a moment. He recognized the mountain above Grötöy, where there was a girl with a baby, still waiting, perhaps, for a letter. To the west rose the Lofoten Wall itself, high and white-topped, like a row of huge snowdrifts running out into the ocean, and from the little islands and rocks came the noise of breakers and the screaming of the sea-fowl that flocked about them. "'Lower away!' shouted the headman, and the sail was lowered and the oars were shipped, the heavy Lofoten boat oars, that it takes strong men to balance and force through the water with any effect. Heave the barrel overboard! The barrel, with its beacon pole, went overboard, dragging the long line after it. It danced up and down upon the water, and was left farther and farther astern, as they rowed away, with the line rattling out over the roller on the side of the boat. It was now so far off that it was hardly visible, and the grey stream of net with its sinkers and glass balls began to unwind itself. Henry Robben and Elisus Hilla stood by the roller to keep the meshes and edges of the net from catching on the side of the boat. In front, Lars and Arndt were hanging on to the oars, and in the middle, Cornelis Gumon was fully occupied in keeping the pile of net clear. It went on streaming overboard, floated on the surface for a little while and then disappeared, leaving the waves above it as grey as before. Ah, oh, the first putting out of the nets! The fishing has begun! As the headman looks at these nets that are to go down into the depths and bring money up with them, he thinks, perhaps, of the endless miles of grey coast to the south, and the many cottages where women and children wait through the long winter for their menfolk to return, with well-filled pockets. Is that Edwin Hansen from Varanget in his slim boat over that? Well, the headman in that boat has three families, he alone, for which his boat has to provide, and the three or four others on board probably have theirs too. So a Nuland boat, small as it is, may be sailing for a good many homes. Some of the children have to sleep under the kitchen dresser, but except for that it's all plain sailing. Ha <laughs> ha! Oh, Edwin, Edwin! There now, if there wasn't one of those confounded thieves of fishermen going right across the seal's nets! It was a Newlander, of course, and when Christopher had finished putting out his nets and hoisted the sail again, he made straight for the fellow. Hello there! he shouted. Do you want to sink my nets? Isn't there room for you anywhere else on the sea as there is for others? The headman in the Nuland boat did not even look up, but replied in his sing-song voice, I suppose we've got the rights to put out our nets in the Almighty's own sea. We didn't know that Stotslanders owned the sea up here. You just take care what you're about, muttered Christopher, as he dropped off before the wind and sailed in again toward land. On the following day snow was falling, and there was the same crowding together of the boats as they set sail. It was a red-letter day for the Stadslanders, who were going to haul in their nets for the first time this winter. Out over the banks, however, it was impossible to see landmarks through the thickly falling snow, and the hundreds of boats wandered this way and that, hour after hour, each in search of its barrel. 
They saw sails appear a boat length or so to the right or left, one going in this direction, another in that, and the men on board quite white to their very hair and beards. Then they were once more lost in the falling snow, and another sail passed close by. They could hear shouts between boats that they could not see. "'Have you found anything?' "'No, have you?' "'No.' They felt that they were over the banks, but were they wandering away westward toward Stamson or eastward to Kabelvog? They sailed upon the blue-gray waves, lashed by the snow from the low clouds. Some hove to or lowered the sail so as to hold a consultation. Others went on at haphazard and nearly ran into a comrade. They groped about blindly, the weather did not improve, and they spent half the day in drifting hither and thither upon the grey water. At last the Nulan man found his barrel, and others recollected how they had stood in relation to him yesterday, and managed to find theirs. Damn it all with a limp, was lucky to-day too, and came upon his before the other statsmen, and as the seal men had put out their nets west-southwest of him yesterday, it was easy for them to find their barrel now. The sail came down and the oars were put out, and the barrel was hauled on board. It was a great moment for Lars. He was going to help in the drawing in of Lofoten nets. It might be a good catch or a bad, wealth or poverty. It all depended upon what was in the nets. And now they were beginning to pull them in. Lars hung upon the oar to keep the boat still but he watched the line as it ran in over the roller, with the water dripping from it. Then it grew heavier, and several men had to lend a hand as the net began to come out of the water. The fishing had begun. Christopher had let go the tiller, and stood with the gaff in his hand, ready to bring loose fish on board. The other men pulled and pulled, with faces that wore no expression of expectancy, but only of being absorbed in getting something heavy on board. Haul away, haul a ho. The grey heap now came over the roller, the first net. The water poured from it, and the men's broad white fingerless woolen gloves were soon as wet as the nets, but they hauled on with bent backs and stiffened legs and contorted faces, for it was heavy. Haul away, a ho. The chain of nets was hundreds of yards in length and was now standing obliquely far down in the water. There was no mistake about its being heavy. It seemed determined to go down again, and to take Elesius and Henry Robin with it, but they resisted and hauled on successfully, the rollers swishing and spurting water. But the first nut is empty. It has been on a little pleasure trip some score of fathoms down into the sea, and has taken a look around, and has returned to say that it had seen nothing. The six men in the boat understand it perfectly, and if the other nets tell the same tale, what is the use of their suffering cold and hardship on the sea? They went on hauling, and at last something living was hooked on board, the first cod of the year. The grey fish with the white belly, broad snout and dull eyes looked quite indifferent as to whether it was going to have anything to eat or be eaten itself. Henry Robin took it out of the net and held it up for a moment by the gills with its tail down. A medium-sized cod, but it was the first of the year. Hour after hour they went on hauling, the perspiration streaming from their faces. A few more fish appeared at long intervals. There were perhaps a hundred altogether when the last net had been hauled in. The snow had ceased to fall, and while they were putting out the nets again, it grew colder. The wind was from the land, so they had to tack all the way up to the station again. The cold increased, and the men, who had become so overheated with hauling in the nets, could now do nothing but stand still in the boat and let their wet shirts grow stiff upon their bodies. They passed some boats without rigging, and each with four men in them, sitting one behind another, and each pulling his line out of the water. They're cheats! said Canelas. They fish with bait, those fellows, but no Stadslander would ever fool along with such rubbish. Peter Shusanza's crew had fared no better, and when all twelve men were gathered in the hut and sat in the yellow light of the lamp, the conversation was animated. 
the two headmen were by no means disheartened by the bad beginning. "'We must have fresh fish for supper tonight,' said Peter Sansa as he pulled off his high sea boots. "'If you haven't got enough, Christaver, I can lend you a hundred cod or so. That ought to be enough if we take the liver, too.' Christaver laughed, saying that when twelve men had made a voyage as long as to America to come up here, they must allow that the fishing was capital, when two boats in a single day could get enough for their supper. Elisus Hilla tramped about the room in his wooden shoes, and declared things were going just as he had expected. He would be a rich man, and would buy a large farm and a thick overcoat when he went home in the spring. Was there any one who would buy his nets, for which he had run into debt? Brand new nets with ropes, glass balls, and cork. What offers? His white teeth gleamed between his brown moustache and beard, but his big laughing eye had a sinister look in them. I'll buy them, said Canelis. Splendid, but it must be money down, and then you'll have a whole share of the supper, and I'll take only as much as a half-share fellow, but it must be money down. This, of course, Canelis could not do, so there was no sale. But we've got a scorey here said Peter Sosanza, looking at Lars. You must fetch some brandy man and treat us, for upon my word we need something to cheer us up. Lars tried to laugh the suggestion away, for he would never ask his father for money to buy brandy, as long as the fishing was so bad. They tried to keep their spirits up, but as the evening wore on, their chins sank lower on their breasts. It was hardly likely that they would sleep well to-night, for they would probably dream of being sold up. The beginning was bad, and supposing it did not improve, what then? Henry Rabin related, however, how the last time that the fishing had been very good, nothing was taken throughout Lofoten all that January and half of February, but that then the cod came in on their way out to sea, and there were so many taken in a fortnight that the fishermen made more than they could ever remember having made before. "'So we mustn't be anxious,' he said, stroking his blond moustache and glancing from one man to another. Next morning they awoke to find that the weather was such as to prevent their going out. The storm raged all day, ships broke from their moorings in the bay and were thrown upon the islands, the forest of masts in the sound and the harbour swayed and shrieked, and tiles were wrenched from roofs and blown about the station.' Above, in the grey sky, white gulls battled on heavy, stiff wings against the wind, and their cries were like warnings of evil from heaven itself. The fishing station had become a prison in which several hundred men were confined. The shop was full of men in blouses and southwesters. Now and then a few of them would fight their way up to a rock and stand there with their oilskin coats flapping in the gale, and their hands pressed upon their southwesters to keep them from flying away, while salt spray and seaweed were driven in their faces, making their cheeks tingle and their eyes smart. There was nothing to be done indoors. Nets and lines needed no mending yet, but they would never see again what they had put out yesterday with such weather as this. It was not a good beginning. No, indeed, it was not. Among the thousands of men gathered upon these four or five rocks out in the sea, there were only one or two dozen women. Some fishermen lived here all the year around, and they have wives and daughters, and there were maid servants in the houses of the station king, the doctor, and the priest, besides one or two Nuland girls who had come with one or another boat crew to cook for them. There were also a few married women who wore hats and had a distinguished appearance, and two young unmarried ones, the one a governess at the doctor's, the other a telegraph assistant who wore a pas-nez. When a maid-servant or a fisherman's daughter was blown along in the wind, she would pass through a hail of eager remarks from the men she met, but when the womenfolk of the more important men went by, not a word was said, but all eyes turned to stare. If they had only been as high up in the world as a shop assistant or a wharf overseer, but it was no use for a simple fisherman to try to make up to the fine ladies. There is always a swarm of birds of prey hovering over the shoals of fishermen, and they had already arrived. There were Jews who sold watches, peddlers, culpators, 
jugglers who gave performances on a large wharf, missionaries who preached in the fisherman's house, and a man with a barrel organ and a shivering monkey in a red frock. There were also agents for the best and cheapest steamer routes to America, travelers in agricultural implements, and a big man with a sack full of ready-made clothes in front of him, and another on his back. But what was the use of them all? No one had made any money yet. It was only the emigrant agent who attracted any interest, now that the fishing looked as if it were going to turn out badly again. But down the wind came sailing a huge bundle of petticoats and shawls surmounted by a fiery red face emerging from a voluminous hood. She was the personage for whom doors always opened, for she was Barbara the fortune-teller. She was welcomed everywhere, and was treated with coffee and strong drinks. If a man had a frost-bitten toe, she put on cupping glasses in order to draw out the bad blood, and to a nose with an inflamed sore she applied a leech, and she could tell fortunes both in coffee grounds and with cards. Most of the birds of prey lived in her little house at the extreme end of one of the islands, where the fun was kept going until far on into the night, both in stormy weather and in calm. "'Hey, there is Barbara. Come here, and you shall have a dram. You must look at the cards, and see whether there will be any fish this year.' For several days the storm compelled the fishermen to remain on shore, and when the local steamer came in on her way along the Lofoten Wall, she reported having seen boats drifting on the sea, keel uppermost. End of chapter 11 12. Sleeping all day, even if there is nothing to do, becomes tiresome. The men have said all that there is to be said in an ordinary way to those with whom they are living in close quarters in the hut. They know one another by heart. They might say something more, but they know the answer beforehand. If a man is forced to open his lips, it is only to say what he said yesterday. They have listened to one another's watches. They have looked at the calendars engraved on one another's oblong brass tobacco boxes. One man lights a pipe and leans out over the edge of the bunk, and another makes a remark about the weather. It is the same weather as the day before, and there is nothing different to say about it today. At last it is four o'clock, the hour of the afternoon meal, and this is not eaten at the common table. No. Each man is now the guest at his own provision chest, and this meal is something special. It is not merely taking a piece of bread and smearing butter upon it and eating it. No, it is like going away on a little visit to one's home far away in the south. It is probably a mother or a wife who has packed the chest, and a breath of home seems to rise from it when the lid is raised. One feels almost shy because others are present, and so one turns one's back to as many as possible, and bending down, tries to imagine oneself alone. When Peter Jusansa looks into his, he sees a large wooden butter tub in which the yellow butter is sweating tiny drops of water over the salt that is mixed with it. His wife has filled the same tub for many a Lofoten expedition, but now she lies in the churchyard and this time it is his daughter who has pressed the butter down until it is as hard as a rock. She is the daughter who is expecting a baby sometime this winter, but the fellow has gone off and left her, and she probably shed many a tear while she packed the chest. Beside the butter tub there is a large cheese, which his wife, Birgitta, had managed to make before she took to her bed, and as he cuts a slice of the cheese with his sheath knife and lays it on the bread, it seems to him that, after all, Birgitta and he are not altogether separated from one another. And then the big man with a stuffed grey beard makes some remark about the weather, just so that no one may imagine that he is in low spirits. Under the cheese is a layer of flat bread, hard and soft, which is real Christmas fare when one puts treacle on it and there are bags of brown and white sugar for coffee, and then salt meat and sausage and brawn and such like. In the small compartment in the chest there are little bottles of medicine, 
one of Hoffman's anodyne for colds, another of riga balsam for the stomach, and a third of spirits of camphor for wounds. Then there is a little bottle of turpentine for pain in the chest, and beside it lies the prayer book, which his daughter has placed there because her mother would have done so. Every little thing has its separate odor, which mingles with those of the rest of the things and creates this atmosphere of home and care for his welfare. And with every man it is the same. They bend down and retire into solitude. Scarcely a word is uttered. They are all far, far away from Lofoten and the storm. They are among their own people and are happy. Elisus Hilla sits silently munching, bending down now and again over his chest, and feeling all the time that he is with Berit and the children. He certainly would not beat his wife now. They are the very best of friends. Little Olea, who is four years old, has put in one of her doll's garments for father. She had cut two little holes in it and told him to remember to put it on if he had a cold in his chest. He takes it up carefully in his rough hands, watching to see that no one is looking at him, but to his eyes it is not merely a bit of rag, but a picture of the little girl herself. He eats sparingly of the sausage and dried meat, thinking it would not be a bad thing if he had some left to take home to the others in the spring. The wind is blowing outside and in through the cracks in the walls, but the men do not notice it now, for they have themselves come out of the Arctic Ocean, as it were, and are as tough and hard as seaweed. There they sit, digging their sheath knives into the butter that their wives have churned, and the bread that they had got on credit, but it will be just as well not to eat more than they need, considering what the fishing seems likely to be. Christaver and his son bend over the same chest, which is big enough for two, the fair, close-clipped boyish head beside the curly hair of the grown man. The contents of the chest bring to both the thought of the same woman, and they wonder how she is getting on. Occasionally an eye steals a glance at a neighbor, for in a way you may judge of a man by his provision chest. Is it poverty that makes Aunt Olson eat lard instead of butter with his bread, or is he going to stint and save and put by something there, too? Henry Robin sits clearing his throat softly and smiling all over his face, but then he has such a pretty wife that she is the talk of the countryside, and he is with her now. He likes everything that she had thought of putting in for him. It certainly does not matter being only a poor man when you have such a clever wife. Ulaus Truen belongs to Peter Susanza's crew. It is probably only in a spirit of boastfulness that he makes an exhibition of delicacies on the lid of his chest, for he does not touch them, but only munches bread and treacle. He probably means to take it all home again with him, and perhaps sell it at the fair. Who knows? There is one man who crouches down in front of his chest, and that is Cornelis Gumon. He has neither mother nor wife to manage for him up on the little mountain farm, but only his old half-blind father and the little sister who is not yet old enough to be confirmed. There was not much for her to choose from, poor little thing, when she was going to pack the chest for her brother, for they had had no milk just at Christmas time, and had nothing to make either cheese or butter with. If there are no fish this winter, it will go badly with that little farm before the year is over. Lars had already guessed how matters stood with Cornelis, but he did not like to offer him anything out of their own chest. His father, however, had also guessed the state of affairs, for he now took a large lump of butter out of their own tub, and cut off half a goat's milk cheese, and then whispered to Lars, Put that into Cornelis's chest when he goes out. Henry Robin was the first to finish, and he banged down the lid of his chest and turned the key and then, rising, stretched his arms straight up above his head and took seven deep breaths through his nose. "'Is that good for the health, too?' asked Elisus. "'It's good for the lungs,' Henry replied. "'Lash,' said Peter Shusonsa, "'will you row over for a barrel of water when you've finished?' "'Yes,' said Henry Robin. "'That water in the creek over here is nothing but filth. "'It'll make us ill.' 
It was not Lars who had to do the cooking that day, but any one may send a scory anywhere he like. He was at the age when a lad likes to rank as a man, but when the men treat him only as a boy. Go do that, Lars. Fetch that, Lars. It was the same refrain from morning till night, and a scory must put up with it. He quite dreaded returning from an errand performed. There was always another waiting for him. On this occasion he had to put on his sea boots and oilskins and start off again. The wind beat in his face, and he had to tie his southwester on. There was a deafening noise from the sea, and from the vessels and boats that tugged at their chains and ropes. He jumped down into the boat and began to fight his way through the storm-lashed sea to the mainland to fill his water-barrel. He had to pass vessels that were almost invisible in the flying foam and spray, and at one moment dipped their anchor-chain deep into the sea, and at the next jerked it up so violently that, if the little boat had been rowing past, it would have been flung into the air and capsized. Even here in the bay, Lars had waves to contend with, one of which would have been enough to dash the little boat to pieces against the side of a vessel. At last he reached the beach at the foot of the precipitous mountain wall, from which the fishing station out in the sea looked like some horrible animal wallowing in white foam beneath the dark sky. High up in the air two eagles came sailing in over the sea, crying from time to time, and with wings aslant, wheeling in toward the grim rocks. The storm raged on for days, until one morning the fishermen awoke to find that it was calm weather. Out on the banks they found their nets a long way from the place where they had been put out, most of them torn to shreds and tangled up with other nets. This was indeed a good beginning for all their hopes. But then the cod came in. End of chapter 1213. They came so suddenly, and it is just the weather one would wish to have when the incoming is at its height. The west fjord lies under a heavy swell, crisped by a light breeze and sprinkled over for miles along the banks with a multitude of black dots, the boats. In the air above hover clouds of white gulls, and loons and cormorants fly shrieking hither and thither. There is a stir in the sea, and yet not a wave disturbs its calm. The line fishermen are pulling up caught on every hook, and the cheats keep on hauling in big lively fish. The nets are heavy today, and the men have to pull hard, the grey stream coming in over the roller is bristling with fish. Now and then one drops off and lies floating belly upward, and the headman nearly falls head first into the water, in his efforts to take it up with a gaff. They will be out a long time today, for the nets must be quite cleared of fish, so that they can be put out again. Oh ho! Oh ho! It became difficult for Arndt and Lars to keep the boat steady, as it sank deeper and deeper in the water, with its ever-increasing load. The stern compartment and midships were already full, and it began to be full everywhere, and there were still several nets to come in. Pull away! Aho! What did it matter that the day was passing without their having had a bite of food? Wonderful things were happening. Which of them noticed that it was beginning to grow dusk? The men were in a perspiration, and that they were accustomed to, but the rest was something new. They looked at one another and laughed, and then went on pulling. At last the Lesu's Hilla could no longer contain himself, and began crowing like a cock. It was infectious, and a man from Ibista in the north, on board one of the cheats' boats, answered with a cock crow that was still better. There was scarcely time or opportunity to look up, but a third cock crowed about a mile farther out, and goodness knows how many miles it may have spread. Here and there a dispute would arise between two boats whose nets had become entangled with one another. Larsha's hands were blistered with manipulating the heavy oar all day, but he did not notice it until the nets were put out again and they began to row back in the dark. There was a good seven miles to row against the current, and with a heavily laden boat, 
and the rowers would have to put their backs into it. Lars soon felt that the whole palm of his hand was covered with blisters, but he had to go on rowing the same as the others. All the fish would have to be cleaned before the men had supper and went to bed. It was of no use considering whether he was tired. They had fish now, and that was what they had come to Lofoten for. Lars felt that the blisters broke, and that the skin was rubbed up so that his woolen glove stuck to the raw flesh. But they were a long way from land, and there was nothing to do but to row. The boat seemed to grow heavier and heavier, but they must pull with a will, for it was late and there was still much to be done. Behind them stretched the dark surface of the West Fjord, crossed by a broad path of moonlight in which the water rose and fell in a long, slow swell. There was a sound of oars and boats in all directions. Far away in the darkness a Nulander began to sing, and Canelis Gumon, tired though he was, joined in while he plied his oar. On the shore side stood the Lofoten Wall, with its snowy peaks looking like silver in the moonlight, and below on the water beacon lights, and lights in fishing stations, every here and there for mile upon mile, shining through the still air. Lars felt that his gloves were damp with blood from the sores on his hands, and there was still a long way to row, and the current was against them. The harbour lights showed green and red in the distance, and a steamer passed them with a row of lighted portholes. For a moment Lars let go his hold of the oar, and it was like laying his bare hand upon red-hot iron, but a shout from his father made him grasp it again. It was anything but pleasant to go on rowing and rowing and rubbing up the raw flesh, but for the moment the one important thing was to come ashore and set to work on the fish. There was already a great noise going on around the purchasing vessels in the bay, where the fish was being thrown on board, and the few crews that had finished their work and had come ashore had presumably drunk a dram or two, for there was singing and yelling on the islands in all directions. The Stotlanders always cleaned their fish before they sold it, removed the roe and liver, and cut off the head. The roe they salted in barrels to be sold when the price was sufficiently high in the spring, but they sent the liver home, for they earned more by making it into fish oil themselves. So the next thing to be done was to stand on the rocks through the greater part of the night, and by the light of a lantern clean fourteen or fifteen hundred cod before there could be any question of eating or sleeping. The weather was fine but cold. The knives were busily cutting open the fish, but the men could not have their gloves on and their fingers, the backs of their hands, and their wrists became coated with blood and slime, which turned to ice. Arndt Olson had to be taught this too, and it took some time, and he was nearly crying over the numbness in his fingertips. It was quiet on the sea, and was growing quieter in the bay too, for the night was far advanced, but the Stotslanders still worked on at their fish. However long it took, they would have to finish it, at any rate by the time they had to put to sea again. Lars found the smarting of his hands become almost unbearable with the handling of the sea-salt fish, and he could have danced and howled with the pain, but this was not the time for childish whimpering. He was a Lofoten man now. The stooping position was trying, especially for men who were already weary, but their knives slashed away liver in one tub, row in the other, and the rest of the intestines pitched into the sea, and the fish thrown to one side. The moon was reflected in the sound, the snow creaked beneath the feet of a solitary night-wanderer, and the whole station slept, but the men went on silently preparing fish. It was not until the approach of morning that Christavr called to Lars, "'Go up and put the coffee-kettle on to boil, Lars.' The boy staggered away, his head confused, his body bruised and aching, and his hands swollen and bleeding. He is in Lufoten now, and there are fish now. At last the lamp in the hut shone down upon the twelve men seated around the table with their cups of steaming coffee and pieces of bread which they scarcely gave themselves time to butter. 
Their skin was chafed with the cold and the sea water, and their eyes were red with looking at the riches of the sea and with their greed for more, but above all with toil. When they had finished their meal, Lars staggered to his bunk, and throwing himself upon it without removing his sea boots, fell asleep instantly. It seemed to him only a minute later that he felt his father shaking him. Up with you. We're going out again. Lars opened his eyes and stared. Was he not to be allowed to sleep a few minutes either? Come now, said his father. Don't you see that the others have gone down to the boat already? We can sleep when the fish have gone again. Here is a drop of coffee for you. The boy drank it, and, seizing a piece of bread, he stumbled along behind his father to start upon a new day at the oars. It was only later that he found out that, after all, he had slept a few hours while the others were on board a trading vessel that was relieving the seal of fourteen hundred fish. After this followed days in which the whole of Lofoten lay in a fever. The fine weather continued. Steamers passed, hooting, in and out of the harbour. Fish vessels sailed away loaded. Others came empty and proceeded to buy. Floating fish oil boileries cast anchor and wanted liver, and every evening the fishing fleet returned heavily laden from the banks to the station. Fish! Fish! This was going to be a golden year. It was not until late at night that the sea became quiet. There was not a wave upon the scarcely moving surface of the west fjord as it lay in the moonlight. Some blackbirds, cormorants, had settled on the most distant rock, whence nothing was to be seen but the dark water and the shining moon, and far in at the foot of the Lofoten wall for mile after mile, harbour lights and beacons. The snowdrifts on the mountain glaciers gleamed white against the blue of heaven, where the stars of the arctic night sparkled, and the long milky streaks of the aurora glowed and paled. When the grey dawn began to appear, the cormorant took flight with a scream over the water, answered a mile off by the loon. Not until later did the gulls rise and sail out with their first, ah -oo, ah -oo, a fine day, a fine day, ah -oo, ah, ah -oo. They ran chattering about the rocks, where flocks of white-breasted auks and ducks were diving into the water and rocking on the waves. Morn, 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 they cried. At last it was light enough for a flag to be hoisted on the station, and as it ran up, an avalanche of boats and shouts was let loose over the smooth grey water. The shoals of fish had now come almost into land. Women and children rowed out a few boat lengths from the rocks and fished for cod. In the little boat lying to the north of the bay sat Barbara, the fortune-teller, wrapped up in her woolen shawls, hauling in cod on a line, and with her was Moses the Jew in his brown overcoat, with his curly black locks and large hooked nose, pulling up the splendid big fish, one after another. What will man do mit si cod? Why, eat it! or I'll sell it. Why not do a little business? He cannot sell watches on shore when everyone is on the banks. He was a Lofoten man now, and Barbara and he were going shares in the fishing. At a little distance there was another little boat, containing a missionary and a woman of disreputable character whom he was trying to reform. They were both fishing busily. The priest and the doctor were out fishing, and the shop assistants had got hold of a cockle shell and a line with a hook at the end of it. The cod would bite, even if there was nothing more than a reel upon the hook. The days passed, and Sunday came at last. End of chapter 13The men in the hut were asleep. It was Saturday night, and in view of the coming Sunday, the twelve men were at last sleeping soundly, knowing that they would not have to get up again in an hour or two. There were six bunks in the one room, in threes, one above the other, and two men in each. They lay with their heads thrown back so as to breathe freely in long, deep breaths, 
and the various nasal sounds from the twelve men were like the breaking of waves upon rocks. Here a coverlet was raised by a knee, there a foot appeared over the edge of the bunk. They snored and they muttered in their dreams, but they slept. Thoroughly worn out, the perspiring, sea-hardened men drifted further and further off into unconsciousness. Their sleep was as soft as wool, and they sank deeper and deeper into it, and no one was coming to wake them, for they were not obliged to get up. They slept on and on. Just at first, one or two of them were perhaps too tired, and the thoughts and images that passed through their minds too persistent to allow them to lie still. They were rowing so that their fingers were chafed to the bone. They saw the cod rise out of the sea and darken the sky like a multitude of birds. Well, cod could fly, and look, they were made of silver, no, of gold. It was riches. So come, good people, and tell us what we owe you, for this time we can manage to pay. And all the world's splendor floated before their eyes, and they bought it all, and the money, money in hand, everything was sent home to the little cottages on the beach. If there is anything else you want, children, just say so, for the fishing is better than anyone can remember. They buy farms with a garden and avenues of trees and horses and carriages, just as at Lindegord. Now there would be an end to that everlasting complaint of poverty and having no money in one's pocket. Little by little the visions faded, and the men were sufficiently rested to feel their weariness, and lost themselves in a pleasant haze, a quiet landscape, a paradise of rest. The dawn crept into the hut, and they slept. It grew light, and they still slept. Midday came, and no one woke only turned over and slept on. The doctor was an energetic man, and had made up his mind that he would teach the fishermen cleanliness, and today he was going round among the huts to speak a few words of wisdom to the men. He ran into a temperance worker at the door of the Stadslander's hut, and both men stopped. "'Were you going in here, sir?' asked the temperance man. "'That was my intention. And you?' Yes, I had thought of doing so. Well, we can go in together. There may be something for both of us to do. The doctor went in first, and both remained standing on the threshold, as though arrested by a vision. The floor was one confusion of wet sea boots and leather clothing. The table was covered with half-empty cups, spilled coffee and fragments of food. Round the stone-cold stove hung damp oilskins and woolen vests, and the odor of fish oil, leather, damp wool, and exhalations from human bodies made the two gentlemen gasp for breath. They turned and stole softly out, with a peculiar feeling of respect for the sleep they witnessed, and carefully closed the door. Twilight was falling over the station, and the men slept on. The tiny windows grew gray and then black, and they still slept. At last Peter Shusanza sat up and rubbed his eyes, and then took a match and struck it on the wall. It was seven o'clock by his watch. It was too early to get up on a Sunday morning, so he drew the coverlet over him and went to sleep again. Next, Elesos heard sounds of talking outside and, getting up, went out. When he returned, he cried, Get up, men, we've slept all day, and it's Sunday evening, do you hear? Wake up, I'll make the coffee. He lighted the lamp, made a little clearance in the hut, and put on the kettle. The others went to sleep again, but Elesus was in a good temper and was splendid now that things were going well. It did not take him long to think out a little surprise. He would take a little of his soft flatbread, spread butter and treacle on it, cut it neatly up into pieces and put it on a plate, and then serve the company with early morning coffee in bed at eight o'clock in the evening. He washed himself, combed his hair and beard, and made himself spruce, and then hunted up a blue check shirt that would do well as a housemaid's apron, and tied it around him. And when everything was ready and coffee steaming in twelve cups, he began singing a Christmas hymn to wake them up, for there could be no mistake about its being Christmas when they were served with such fare in bed. 
When at last they sat up and were quite awake, a neighbor came in and told them that there had been no one at church except the priest and the sacristan. The whole station had been asleep. This made them at last understand that it was not morning but evening, and they looked at one another and found out that they were ravenously hungry. They had not tasted hot food for a whole week and had gone hungry for several days, so they needed something more than coffee and flatbread now. Someone said, Melia, and instantly there was a chorus of Melia. That was a dish to set before a king, and they had not had it yet this year, so of course it must be Melia. Henry, said Peter Shusansa, I know you're a good hand at that, so you must set to work. While Henry Robin was busy over the hearth in the kitchen, Lars had to take out pen and ink and write Lofoten letters for the men. Most of the men had arrived at the age when they no longer ventured to use a pen, for the many years of Lofoten fishing had made their hands stiff and swollen. Now you must show us whether you can write, they said to the scory, for now their wives and children must have a little news, and perhaps a little paper money inside too. But don't write outside the envelope that there is money inside, for then there will be such chatter and gossip about it all over the neighborhood. Lars sat under the yellow light of the lamp, trying to keep his eyes open while he scrawled what the men wanted to say. His hands were terribly sore and stiff, but Cornelis Gumon had taught him to rub them well with tar and tallow. What do you want to say, Eleseus? Ah, you must say that we're working as hard as we can. Bending closer, he added in a low voice, though everyone in the hut could not help knowing it, and you can say that we can't complain about the fishing, but it'll be just as well if she keeps that to herself. They came one after another, with a crumbled envelope in one big hand and a sheet of blue-lined paper in the other, bought at the shop for two euro one day when they had been kept on shore. See here, you must scribble a few words for me too. And every one of them wanted to say that they could not complain with regard to the fishing, but they always added this in a low voice, bending down to say it. A certain shyness came over these big fishermen when they had to go to their chests to take a bank note out of the small compartment with the others looking on, and it was still worse to have to go forward into the light and say that it was what the wife was to have. It was almost like showing an engagement ring when it was meant to be secret. When he came to the table, the man would make his back as broad as possible toward the others and push the note toward the boy, as invisibly as he could manage to do it, saying, Perhaps you'd better put that inside. While this was going on, Christophe had clattered out into the kitchen in his wooden shoes and closed the door behind him so that he and Henry Robin were alone. Ah, oh, I shall be glad of a little help, said Henry, who was busy with the fire and saucepans. Christophe looked at him. There is something I want to talk to you about privately, he said. Is there? Is it anything unpleasant? Henry had already found time to comb his hair and beard, and in all probability had been out and snuffed up a little sea-water as well. You were one of my guarantors, so that I saved my boat. Aye, but was that too much? A clever fellow like you must have his own boat. Christophe insisted, however, that Henry should accept a service from him in return. Aye, well, if you'll train me to be as good a headman as yourself, I'll— you must see that it's quite out of the question for you to be a half-share man. Was it? But he had no nets and no share in the boat, so he was a half-share man like the others. Wasn't that all right? Christophe told him that he could have nets from him, so that he could be a whole-share man. You must agree to it, he said. It was no small matter, for the head man was doing nothing less than doubling the profits of the other man. Henry looked first at him, and then at the pen on the fire, his lips smiling, but his eyes serious. "'You want me to take payment for a service I did you,' he said at last. 
Well, you lost your nuts last year, and now you have an opportunity of getting them back again. We can make a new agreement. Now you must be good enough to say yes. Hmm. But you took the risk for us all together, both for nuts and boat, and he who makes the venture takes the price. We people at Robin can't eat more than our fill, and we won't take the money that you've the right to. Thanks all the same, but come in to supper now. Christopher stared. Henry need only hold out his hand, and he could have nuts and double the profits on his share, and the fellow goes and says, No. Melia! Get away from the table, men. Here is supper at last. Henry brought in several plates of broken-up flatbread, and then, taking in the saucepan full of boiled, steaming hot liver, he ladled out a liberal helping into each plate. The oil glistened as it flowed over the piles of flatbread, and over it was strewn grated goat's milk cheese, after which treacle was poured all over in long, golden-brown, sinuous lines. The next thing was to stir it all up with a spoon, and there you had a mixture that was worth tasting. The twelve men seated themselves around the table and set to work. It was not easy to say when they at last had a spoon in their hands. It seemed to them that they had lived upon coffee and bread as long as they could remember. But this was not simply food. It was like a wedding. The plates were emptied in an incredibly short space of time. Oh, yes, Henry Robin had more liver, and he had soon prepared new platefuls, and then the spoons went at it again. What? Were the dishes empty already? They were only just beginning to enjoy their meal. One or two let out their belts a hole or two, but all felt that there was not a wedding at the station every day. Faces, beards, fingers, shone with oil, treacle, and cheese. Lars had to go out to the snowdrift where the liver was kept fresh and bring in another saucepanful. It took some time to boil, but now they could have a smoke and a dram while they waited. There were footsteps outside, and Jakob came sailing in, swinging round his long leg as he turned to shut the door behind him. "'Good evening, men. Why, damn it all, couldn't I tell by the smell that you were having something good for supper? Come in and sit down.' came from the smokers sitting round in the room. The men winked at one another, for whenever Melia was served on the station, Jakob never failed to get wind of it, and would put in an appearance there, even if he had already eaten his fill of that delicacy in his own hut. "'You must find a place at the table,' said Peter Shusansa, an invitation to which Jakob was not slow to respond. He brought news, however— "'There is another tax to be laid upon us fishermen,' he said, helping himself to a spoon which he polished on his sleeve, just as a fresh supply of Melia was brought in. "'What's it going to be now?' "'Why, every boat's got to hand over fifty fish to the hospital for medicine. That's a nasty one for the fishermen.' The other said, "'Hm,' and were of the same opinion." As Jakob sat there, the difference between him and the others was very apparent. His straight black hair and beard were in marked contrast to their fair hair and blue eyes. They wore homespun, woven in their own homes from the wool of their own sheep, but Jakob had no one to weave for him. He had to go to the shop for all that he clothed himself in, and was now dressed in an Iceland jersey and leather waistcoat, and the blouse outside these was blue. Whom had he to fish for? No one. He belonged to Lofoten, and was with the others on the way north and home again, and he belonged to the same neighborhood down there, but his real home was in the cabin of the sea flower. There was only one thing that could explain his not as yet having been killed in a fight, or ruined by drink, or drowned through mad sailing, and that was that he was Jakob. And here he sat, in the best of tempers, eating melia and drinking drams, the immortal, lame Jakob, damn it all with a limp, the stormy petrel on shore. He told them that a new preacher was expected to arrive. The priest was furiously angry, but the fellow was said to be very good at explaining the word of God, and as he said the word of God, Jakob put his head on one side and looked at the lamp, 
and almost fancied he tasted something sweet. When the dish was empty, he rose and took his departure. He had an inkling that there was another hut where Melia was to be had, and when he came out into the dark, he steered his course through the snow, straight for a light that shone from a rocky knoll. His southwester and broad back certainly swung a little too much to the right, but this did not prevent him from singing his favorite song, Oh, dear Maria, oh, ho! The hut to which the scent now led was occupied by Andrea Secra, headman on the stormbird, and here there were both Melia and spirits to be had. But the men were sleepy and wanted to go to bed, for they would have to get up early to begin a week of toil. Once more Jakob turned out into the dark night. By this time he had put away a great many small drams and taken a good cargo of Melia on board, but he steered for the harbour light and remembered more or less where his little boat lay. Of course, as he staggered along past the little dark huts, he had to sing his song, Oh, dear Maria, oh, ho! Hello! He had tumbled into a snowdrift. But what was there to prevent his lying there for a little while quietly, and looking at the stars, and then scrambling up again? The lights on the wharves and in the huts were out, and no one saw that Jacob was white on one side and dark on the other. Ha! There was a fellow stealing along with a girl. Ha! Ha! Did he think that Jacob had never been young himself? At last he reached his boat, unfastened her, and tumbling in, got out the oars. Beneath him lay the water of the sound, dotted with stars, and above him was the sky, sparkling with still more stars. And now the wharves began to move backward, away from him. Well, well, let them go. Ships and boats on the harbour, the noise of breakers out at sea, darkness and peace on land and water. Oh, dear Maria, oh, ho! End of chapter 14。15. It was winter too, with snow and storm on the grey shore far down in the south. Wives and children were each busy in their own way, but their thoughts were with the men upon the sea, far, far up in the north. High up among the hills on a little mountain farm, there lived an old man with a white beard the father of Cornelius Gumon. He groped his way about, out and in, and grew more infirm every day. Was it not strange? Once he had had such capital sight that he could distinguish a sheep one from another miles away on the mountain, and he could follow the boats and ships down below on the fjord, and knew them all and could give them their right names. Even in the lowlands at the foot of the West Mountains, right on the other side of the fjord, he could see a boat lying on the beach, and the smoke rising from the red and grey farms. And now he could scarcely see his own hand. Think of it. He used to earn a good deal of money by making birch brooms and wooden shoes, but now he only cut himself because his hands trembled so, and besides he could not wade through the deep snow to find material. His little daughter fed the sheep, the two cows, and the little fjord horse, and he was not so bad but that he could find his way to the stable and feel the animals to see if they were properly cared for. But except for that, all he had to do was to sit on a stool beside the stove and smoke a small iron pipe, keep up the fire, and let the time pass. The wind was always blowing up on the hills, and had gradually taken shape in his mind and become a person to whom he could talk. He had the child to talk to, and she did what she could, but at least one evening a week she went off on skis the three or four miles down to the nearest neighbor to chatter and enjoy herself with other young folk. No, the wind was far more to be counted upon. It was always about the house. The old man was now sitting alone and talking to the wind about Cornelis. They were both agreed that he was a capital fellow, not afraid of either a dram or a fight, and was good for two, if necessary, and kind-hearted if you only took him in the right way. They both agreed on this. And now the winter was passing, and soon he would be coming home with his earnings, and then they would be able to pay both the shop and the bank, 
and as far as the bailiff was concerned, Canales would be able to shut him up. As he sat there with his long white hair and beard, and his face looking ruddy in the light from the stove, the wind and he were as soon agreed about another thing, namely, that Canales must soon get married, for a grown-up woman was needed in the house, and he, the old man, though not getting younger, was still able to rock a cradle. Rock a cradle? Yes, said the wind. We, we. Rock a cradle? Yes, said the old man, as he watched the flames, and then he wiped his red, watery eyes and shook his white head. Hush, a by baby. If it were a boy, of course he would be called Ula after his grandfather. Boy? Yes, said the wind. Ula? Yes, said the wind. Hush, a by baby. The wind that the old man was talking to was the northwest. It came in from the sea, took a leap over Blue Hill, and began to thunder and roar in among the mountains, and covered the fjord and the low-lying districts with spray and driving snow day after day. White snow wraiths were whirled up sky-high and carried headlong through the gloom. Down on the beach the lights in the cottage windows could scarcely be seen. The cottagers seemed to be crouching down and trying to hide in the snow from sheer terror of the storm. On one such evening the fourteen-year-old Ulf Miran was coming on skis from the shop, which was also the post office, with a bag upon his back and his cap drawn down over his ears. He had with him a number of letters that had to be distributed about the neighborhood that evening. Lufoten Letters it is quite an event when one drops into a little cottage. Bless my soul, says the wife, it can't surely be true. She has been waiting and longing, and there it is at last. Is it really true? Andreas Ekra's wife, Anna Marta, had been to the bog to get some peat, and on her way back had a hurricane to struggle against upon a road that was nothing but snowdrifts, into which both she and the load sank. She pulled with all her might and waded in snow up to her hips, and if any one imagined that she was such a follower of fashion as to be wearing cotton unmentionables under her petticoat, he would be very much mistaken. Then the sled pitched on its head and had to be pulled up, then its hind part sank deep in, and seemed to be sitting, looking at her like some animal, and the lashing and whirling of the wind and snow in her face were enough to make any one take God's name in vain and swear. Deuce take the drifts! She was only a woman, and she was covered with snow from head to foot. And there! If the sled didn't upset again, and the peat slide off and lie in the heap on the snow— no, when once the devil is let loose. But home it should go, and she swore once more, and then set to work pushing and pulling and struggling, as if she was raging and clawing and fighting with seven hundred little devils. The fire was burning on the hearth in the kitchen, and there was a light in the window when she at last came through the drift close to the kitchen door, and at that moment a boy on skis came past the corner of the cowshed. Hello! he cried. Is that you, Ulf? You're not going around with Lufoten letters, are you? Yes, I am. There isn't one for me, I suppose. No, but nearly everyone else in the neighborhood's got one. Letters with money in, too? Yes, there are some with sealing wax on that I had to sign my name for. And the boy went on his way through the wind. Ah, oh, that Andreas! It was just like him. He never wrote home from the beginning to the end of the winter, and he never sent her a penny, even when the fishing was so good that he was rolling in money. It would serve him right if she left off taking any trouble about him, and upon her word she would make up his bed in the cowshed when he came home in the spring, and she would sleep in the bed in the living room herself with the two children. The horrid fellow! His old mother was sitting beside the stove, smoking chewing tobacco in a clay pipe. She was always scolding, and nothing that her son's wife did was right. But she herself had to be looked after and cared for like a baby. Alna Marta brought in the peat and brushed the snow from her dress, 
and as soon as she had had her supper and put the children to bed, she sat down to spin yarn for the pastor's wife. Someone had to earn a little money if the man of the house did nothing for his family, and as she sat there in the lamplight, tall and fair, and made the spinning wheel whir, she actually began singing a love ballad, even though the old woman beside the stove growled and held her hands over her ears. Meanwhile, the boy on skis had stopped at the little red house, where he found Beritilla wading through the snowdrifts with water that she was bringing in for the evening meal. A Lufoden letter! My gracious! Then you must come in, Olaf. How was it possible that this beautiful woman could have taken Eleso's Hilla? It was true that she had had a child with another man who had gone away to America, but even after that, Brandt at Lindegord himself had said that she looked like a princess, and that her hair was like golden sunshine. And then she went and threw herself away upon Eleso's. Since then she had never seemed to have time to sit down. She was running about, indoors and out, from morning till night, perhaps to keep herself from thinking, for Eleusis had forbidden her to let her child set foot in his house. "'I won't have that bastard here,' he used to say. It was a little girl, and the poor board had sent her to a farm where she did a maid-servant's work, although she was only twelve years old. It was hard for her mother never to see her, never to be allowed to visit her. The beautiful woman was becoming hollow-cheeked and thin, but her hair was the same as before, and, when she let it down, the streams of golden sunshine fell almost to her feet. Now a Lufoten letter had come for her, and when she sat down, cold as she was, beneath the lamp, and read the few lines it contained, her eyes filled with tears. There was a ten krona note enclosed, and there were many wives who would be only too glad if they received no more than half of that. Now, wasn't it true, as she always said, that the Lesus was very good? Ulf Miran glided on through the wind and the darkness from house to house with Lofoten letters. At home at Miran there was great excitement, for the letter to Maria was a real true money letter with many seals upon it. When she took it in her hand, she turned it over and over, and held it under the lamp to see if it were Christopher himself who had written it, and round her pressed several heads, fair and dark, trying to get a view. When she opened the letter, several banknotes fell out, which she hastily replaced in the envelope. Her husband wrote that the fishing was quite extraordinarily good, so that things might go better at Miran after this. The bedroom door opened, and the old woman with spectacles upon her long nose appeared. A Lufoten letter! Well, I declare! Maria's mother, Lava Rutosen, happened to be staying there just now. She was to have gone home several days ago, but how could she, in such weather, and with the roads in such a state? She now appeared beside the other old woman at the bedroom door, and asked if it was a money letter. Yes answered Maria. The two old women came nearer with inquisitive faces, but Maria had already hidden both letter and notes in her bodies. "'How are they getting on?' asked Christopher's mother. "'Oh, they're getting on all right.' There was nothing more to tell the two old people. A little secret between her and Christopher did not concern others. "'And Lars?' asked Lava again. Yes, he's working as hard as he can, too. And the fishing's so extra good, people say. Is that true? It was her mother-in-law who made the inquiry. Oh, it can vary so, said Maria, clambering up onto her weaving stool and beginning to weave. Old people should not be told too much. When Olaf had eaten his supper, he had to go out into the storm again, for there was still one more Lofoten letter, and they are not things that you allow to lie until the next morning. It was for Sidi Skara, who lived away up on the hillside with a lot of children, and had very little of either food or firing. No one in the neighborhood would have her husband, Severin, on his boat, because he was always swarming with vermin, but he went north by steamer and shipped with a line fisherman year after year. It was not much that he brought home, but he was better than nothing. 
Both winter and summer, the grey little cottage on the hillside presented a poverty-stricken appearance. The buildings were in such a state of disrepair that the cows in the cowshed were almost up to their knees in water, and the children wore caps pulled down over their ears and woolen gloves indoors, because the wind blew right through the walls. It was hither that Olof at last made his way. On opening the door he ran into a skin coverlet that was hung up to keep out the draught. Within was a room in which stood three beds full of shivering children, while a pale woman sat carding wool by the light from the stove. She was wrapped in a large faded woolen shawl, but she too was blue with cold. She was not much more than thirty, but her face was pale, worn, and lined, and her eyelids so heavy that she seemed hardly able to raise them to look at the newcomer. A Lofoten letter. As she opened it, a five krone note dropped out. Dear me! This was wealth indeed. Sit down and I'll get you some flat bread and cream, she said, feeling that she must do something in return for the blessing he had brought them all. Olaf could not wait, however. He was the man of the house at home now, so he had to be off again. There were many other things for such a lad to do in a neighborhood where all the men were away. A little while ago a girl went out of her mind, and he had to go and watch over her for a day and a night, and then go with her and her mother to the asylum. And when old Truen had inflammation of the lungs, Olaf had had to get a horse from Lindegård and go for the doctor. People felt that they must go for help to the menfolk that were left. He forced his way through the northwest wind, his face lashed with snow and sea spray, and with sand and seaweed that the wind whirled up from the beach. As he opened the door at Miran, the wind tore it from his hands and swung it back against the wall. The house shook, the sudden gust of wind extinguished the lamp, and the children began to cry. It is unpleasant to be out on such a stormy night. It is bad enough down by the fjord, but what must it be for those who perhaps are out on the sea? Lofoten, Lofoten. Maria had relighted the lamp and put the children to bed, and had returned to her weaving. The house shook with the wind, and it was a relief to her to have her fingers occupied when the gusts of wind threatened to lift the cottage and carry it away through the night. Was she afraid? No, but she felt inclined to sing, to cry out wild, incoherent words, only to drown those shrieks of anguish out in the darkness, where the storm was like a howling of evil spirits. She worked on with busy fingers. It was no ordinary piece of weaving, not homespun or linen. It was a hanging with figures woven into it and she had learned how to do it from the master forester's wife up in the valley when she was a girl. This lady had lately come to her with a pattern for her to weave from, and had explained the figures to her, though she had learned about them in her school days. It represented the legend of Siegfried, and at present she was doing the part where Siegfried was riding on his horse Crane through a great crackling fire on the mountain of Franconia. As she sat there with the storm about her, she seemed to be looking at her own life as she wove the great legend of long ago into her web. She was condemned to live here by the sea, which she hated. It would almost be a rest to go out of her mind some day, but she would have to take Ristavid with her. She could easily throw herself into the sea in weather like this, but she must have Ristavid with her. On such a night she sometimes felt as wicked as a witch, almost as when Siegfried drank the blood of the dragon. She wanted to do evil, she wanted to kill, but... But she must certainly have Kristavid with her. It was near midnight, and the storm was increasing, but she sat on, weaving the saga into her web. The two old women had gone to bed in the bedroom, and the children were whimpering in their sleep. The cottage shook and the spray dashed against the window. Suddenly Maria's mother-in-law appeared at the bedroom door in her nightdress without her spectacles. "'Good Lord!' she exclaimed. "'Don't you hear the storm? What must it be like in Lofoten? Oh, good Lord!' The tall old woman came in and began to walk up and down the room with folded hands. 
Her black cap was still on the back of her head, with wisps of white hair escaping from it. There will be dreadful things happening tonight, Maria. There will be many sleeping tonight never to wake again. God help those who are on the sea tonight, and God be merciful to every sinner that has to stand before his judge tonight. We are in danger wherever we go. Tonight, Maria, oh, Lord Jesus! She had experienced many such stormy times in years past, and on a night like this she forgot that she was old and rheumatic, and became young and active from the great things she saw. It was as though the Almighty Himself came down and took her with Him in all His power, as though she could almost open the door and fly out into the awful storm. Lord Jesus, what a night, Maria, what a night! Maria went on with her weaving, her face pale and hard. The old woman began singing the hymn for those at sea, and it sounded weird in all the noise outside. Maria turned to look at the old woman in her nightdress, walking up and down the room with wide open eyes, singing to what she saw. Her face seemed to be the face of the very storm itself, and her voice the voice of drowning men. They dared not put out the lamp when at last they went to bed. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, sighed Maria too, as she pulled the clothes over her head. But it was not a prayer to him, for God was only the power of evil in storm and disaster. Pray to him? No, she closed her lips tightly and hardened herself in defiance. Pray to him? Never, never. Away up in the valley he was quite different. He made the ground fruitful and ripened the corn. There he represented still moonlit evenings, the call of the black cock on the hill, the trickling of the brook, light nights and warmth. But here beside the sea he was a different god, whom to know might be to lose one's wits. Ah, oh, if she could only take the children and move up into the valley some day, what a good woman she would be. But Gristavid would have to come too. There was a noise on the porch, and someone tried the door. Or was it the wind? No. Is it possible that anyone can be out in such weather? It was a neighbor, Ulina Truan. Don't be afraid, she said, but Peter Jusanza's girl's taken ill. Goodness me, exclaimed Maria, sitting up. You must get up and go there with me, said Ulina. She can't be left to lie there and die, and Ulf must go for the midwife. A little later, two women and a boy were struggling through the storm and the snowdrifts as they made their way along the road by the light of a lantern. End of chapter 15